give it a brief. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm going to get everybody loaded here and, uh, you know, settled in, let audio video sync up, which, you know, to be fair, might be a little bit off. Don't freak out. This is mostly going to be a live stream. It's like a live podcast. I guess we can put it that way. There's going to be some screen sharing um, and a lot of talk about different topics about the audio industry, the car industry. And I have a guest on today that uh, I'm very, very happy to because this is a man that I've uh, followed on his side of the business and because I'm an audio, I love audio video and he's been in the business for a long time. His name's Gene Della Sala. He's the president of Audioholics. And uh, Gene, why don't you introduce yourself? Just to give your background for people that don't know. Well, first of all, Mark, I really appreciate you having me on your channel. Um, I think it's awesome. I love collabs like this because I think there's a lot of dual interest i think if people are into cars performance cars they definitely overlap they're into audio especially you're listening to music in your car right so i think these kind of collabs are great so real quick on me i'm an electrical engineer i was a design engineer um, for about seven years i did government defense audio communication systems but my passion has always been home audio and i wanted to become an audio engineer in college and then i realized it was really difficult to get a job that pays well at a college doing audio. So I figured out uh, if any Star Trek fans are out there, I pulled a Kobayashi Maru. I, I beat the no win scenario by starting a website in 99, working as an engineer for about three or four years until I could turn it into profitable enough to eventually quit my very secure government job and then do this full time. And I've been doing it full time since 2002 and we're going on 25 years on April 18th this year. That's crazy. I, I, you know, and, and I think I'm going to get right into the, the meat and potatoes of this because uh, I don't know if you know this, Gene, but our last couple live streams where Jack and I were on here, we went four hours. Um, <laughs> and it's it's uh, painful for the people watching, but they I, I don't it's it, it gets enjoyable, but I'm not going to keep you here for, for four hours. <laughs> so uh, let's let's get into uh, one of the things. Why? Obviously, car audio and home theater seems to be a really common topic in the automotive community. There seems to be a huge overlap between people that love music. Um, I know Misha, he is a guitar player in Periphery, a metal band. And he told me this. It's like it's crazy the amount of people that he meets that are big into like engineering music and like production also love the mechanical and technical part of cars. And there's such an overlap. So I, I find it interesting that you also are into the car world. What's your background with that? So I've always loved cars and I always joke with my wife. I'm like, man, in 99, if I would have started a car review website instead of home theater, I'd be checking out Lamborghini Diablos right now, you know, because I'm at the very top of the stuff that I'm able to play with, with home audio. So I'm a car enthusiast. Um, I'm a BMW fan. I've owned a few BMWs. I have an M240i. I also have an X5. Um, and I just love it. I, you know, for years when I was a kid, there were two, I'd go to a magazine, you know, a bookstore, I'd go to the uh, supermarkets and two things I'd look for. I'd look for home audio magazines like Stereo Review, Stereo File. And then I would look at car and driver, motor trend, and I would just gawk at the cars, the cars that I could never afford. I'll probably never drive. I'm obsessed with the performance metrics and how they were tested. And I just have such a high respect for people that do car reviews because you're putting your own risk on the line, right? Running on a track and putting the cars to the limits. And I just, I love it. I just love the adrenaline feel of high performance, anything when it comes to home theater, when it comes to car performance. And I just love engineering marbles. You know, I also like airplanes, aviation. I'm a huge fan of like the SR 71 Blackbird and, I follow all the World War II documentaries and just how aviation evolved over the years. So I think there's a lot of overlap, especially being an engineer and I'm electrically or mechanically inclined. I just like engineering what humans can produce. And do you do you find that, you know, obviously you're big into, well, it's your job, right? You test probably thousands of products at this point. Um, 
how do you find when you get in a car do you like listening to music how does that overlap for you or do you just not care you go back home and deal with it i struggled a lot believe it or not um because i have such a good reference for what good sound is in the home that when i'd go and buy a new car and i would listen to the system and then most of the time they'd be atrocious right yeah. Um, I, and it would suck because I would like the car. Let's say I, at the time I would buy like a Nissan Maxima when it was, when Nissan was a really good brand in my opinion <laughs> and the car audio sucked. I, you know, it was okay. If you had the bow system, it was listenable. But then I noticed as years gone on, some of that got worse on these cars. And then when I went to a BMW on the two series, I, um, I bought a used two series and it had the Harman system in it. And I thought it had the potential, but something was wrong in it, right? Yeah. So I contacted Harman because I have friends there. And I'm like, there's too much center channel in, in the system. Is there a way to turn it down? And it turns out it wasn't their fault because BMW uh, contracted Harman to do all their audio systems. But BMW only has certain budgets, I guess. They allocate to each car. So like in the 2 Series, and I don't know if that's the case now with the new 2 Series because I know nothing about the... Mexican made German, uh, the Mexican made two series compared to the 2018 that I own. But back in the day, they put, they couldn't put logic seven in that car. So what they did was they did left plus right. And they dumped it into the center with no volume control for the center. And that's a good way to kill soundstage. You go and you do that kind of thing and without lowering the volume or having any control of that, it kills the soundstage. So what I did was after I got my second 240, cause the first one got totaled, someone rear ended me. I bought it with the regular system without the Harman system because I was going to do my own upgrades and the regular system was not even listenable. It was just so scathing, the tonality of it, you know, it just sounded terrible. So I went and I got a uh, Morale driver kit and Jen Hurt underseat woofers and I contacted JL Audio and um, I got a DSP and an amp from them. And then I went out to Miramar and they spent two days helping me tune the system. No center channel, by the way. So the center channel was deleted. And we set up different profiles because if you don't have a center channel, you're only going to have the sweet spot basically where you're sitting when you tune it to the DSP. So if you want to have different sweet spots for the passenger or for the people in the back, you have different DSP settings. And that was a world of difference. I could actually sit in my M240 now, listen to music, and it sounds good. It doesn't sound as good as my home theater, but at least it's reference and it's, it's enjoyable. But yeah, that's that's a struggle, especially when you do long car trips and and you um, have bad audio. But the one thing I did notice is you your ears and your brain kind of adapt to mediocre sound over time. So you learn to live with bad sound until you hear better. Right. So, I mean, until you have reference sound that you can compare it to, most people probably don't pay that much attention to their car audio systems. That's kind of an afterthought, I think, when you're buying a car. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting part, and I don't want to get too in the weeds with uh, the car audio stuff, other than, yes, we test it, um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, uh, Brian. He's an acoustical engineer uh, who's uh, helped me a lot, and obviously Jack, with understanding how car audio is designed because he worked on the back end. So it's going through and really talking to some of these brands where the straight answer is why car audio is not good, is it is not a priority. It's not mm -hmm. a priority in terms of budget for these brands when they go down the list of product planning for cars, unless you get to the ultra high end where, the, you know, you're charging $300,000 where you can put. Most cars are not designed around an audio system in a car. They're designed around packaging of a car. So the audio system gets designed later and thrown in later. And then you get to a lot of the commodity brands. And when I say it's, it's actually extends beyond that, it it's OK, what do we have left over? okay, now put some speakers in it. What's the cheapest we can do it for? Um, and, you know, I've heard directly fr from about certain brands on how much they pay for a driver's set in a car and amplification. And it's it's shockingly low, like shockingly low. It's under, it can be under $100 in some cars and under 200 yeah. for a whole package for a mainstream car. So when you have that type of budget, you're, suppliers are going to be like, okay, we're just going to do whatever. And then the, the engineers that are designing the EQ and doing the car, you know, they got seats, they got reflective surfaces, every car is different. They just try to get it as good as possible where the curve, you know, you're, you're looking at it like, okay, it sounds okay. There's nothing horribly wrong. And that's where it's left. Um, and to your point, right, you get used to that. And most people, because the bar is set so low for car audio, 
Mm. There's there's an exception. There's like 10 cars I can name that are ex exceptional. And you could tell one we knew that they were de designed from the start along with the interior space. So they have a huge advantage, but that, that you can count on one hand how many cars are actually like that. And you just like, hopefully it's not horrible. And that's why we test the cars. Honestly, it's just to have a reference point of like, this is really bad, like really bad. Like the Honda Ridgeline was the worst one we ever tested. Like it, it mm. sound your phone speaker in a cup probably would sound better than that. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not even joking, yeah. um, but, but you know, that's the low point. And then there's the other extreme, but some middle ground. And I think most of them now benchmark each other to the point where, and I know we talked about this on the phone, like Harman or Samsung, Harman owns like everything. So yeah. it's a small group of people that are doing the work. So they know how to do it. And it's just, let's what, how much money do we have? Or how much are they giving us? Okay. Let's yeah. just do the, that. So, um, so two comments I have on, on car real quick. I just saw a comment that says ELS asking about the ELS audio system. I actually had the ELS audio system in my Acura 2007 TL type S and I met Elliot Shiner on the home theater cruise. Um, couple of years after I, I bought that car and I was just giving him feedback. He's the one that came up with the tuning of that system. As you guys know, he's, he's produced music for the multi-channel music for the, for the Eagles and other bands. And I told him, I go, you know what? The system sounds good. It needs more bass. That little eight inch in the back is just not doing it. But the biggest downfall of that system was the three inch wizard cone woofer for the center channel. And you just can't get enough volume out of it. And he said that was a big struggle for him because he wanted a full range center channel in the dash, but the car vendor would not dedicate the space for it. Right. But I know they've upgraded it since then because my my sister in law has a uh, uh, one of their MDXs. Yeah. And that system has been it's been greatly improved. And I think overall the OEM systems are getting better. And in fact, if you look at one thing I like about the BMW, even though their uh, stock system isn't that great. The pre-outs on their head units are flat. So all the DSP is done in the amp in the trunk, which means you can now put your own amp and your own DSP without having to re-EQ the preamp outputs. And they have a strong, I think there was like four volt RMS clean coming out of those um, outputs. So it's plenty of drive for you to match it with an amplifier, but not all the vendors are doing that. Some of the vendors are putting the DSP into the head unit and then you're kind of stuck. You can't really do much modding on that system. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of the way we look at it, right? Nobody is buying a modern car with all the electronics and w what is in most cars. You can't change anything anymore. You can change out some drivers, but you're still limited to uh, what the EQ is baked in in the car. And honestly, when you look at even higher end systems now, like Volvo is a good one. They have the XC90, and I say this a lot. I know people are tired of hearing it, but the XC90 when they did the Bowers was one of the best systems we ever tested in large part you know, the engineers were involved with the interior design of those cars to start and they chose really good drivers and the EQ was great. But as the time has gone on, the XC90 is like a hundred years old now, you can see them with their new head unit design. They've stripped out any EQ that you can do with that car. Like there's no EQing even available. It's just like treble and bass. So they got rid of, I don't even mm -hmm. remember, it was nine or seven band or nine band. Not that you can play with it, but they've removed all that for the mainstream consumer. So really what you see is what you get and nobody's going to modify these cars. Honestly, it just, it's not worth it anymore. Um, yeah. You have to get to like your level and you know, that's so uncommon. Um, to, to, to play with this stuff. So it's, it's disappointing, but to be fair to the manufacturers, uh, Acura is a good one. They just got rid of ELS and they got rid oh, of I ELS. That. Yeah. They, they just switched over this year and all their new cars are going to have some subset of Bang and Olsen. Um, and the, the directive was make it sound like ELS. That's what they wanted. The, you know, the harm for, right? for less money, of course, like, yeah. because it's not a requested feature. So when you go to the MDX Type S, which we had as a long-termer, they have their highest end audio system they ever did. It was the ELS Signature. So that was definitely for the price point on another level. It was pretty close to the Bauer stuff, not as good. Um, but you know, you have that, the Bowers and the BMW, like X7, X, well, you can't really get an X5, but the Bowers is pretty good in there. The Volvo's really good. And then you get into the Burmisters of the higher end Mercedes, which are pretty good. Um, some of the Meridians, and the JLR mm -hmm. test great, but I mean, that's it. Like really that that's it. It's the, other than that, they all very much are all have the same type of problem. They're very bass heavy because they know everybody wants a huge bass curve. They want bass. Yeah. Yep. Like and, the beats headphones used to be, you remember the beats headphones yep. when they first came out, they were just bass yep. machines, not no yep. tonal accuracy at all. Um, you know, I think you go back to the Volvo case. I believe I heard a demo of a Volvo system a few years back at CES or Cedia. 
and that was the one that was using Dirac calibration. And that's Dirac got its uh, got its start in car audio, and that was impressive. The amount of DSP magic they were able to pull off. That's not something. Um, a person could do on his own just messing with little geq filters or peq right. filters in the car so i i do think if you're an audiophile and you're choosing a car and they put some thought into the upgraded audio systems i do find they tend to be worth the extra cost because otherwise you're going to be ripping stuff out you have to take door panels off and i hate to go through that again that was it when i saw my car ripped apart in jail audio's uh yeah. factory i got nervous it was a brand new car and all my door panels were off the trunk was out i was like oh my god are they gonna be able to put this back together and make it tight again so right. i don't know yeah it's tricky it's a double-edged sword and cars are you know if you had it your way you know you would have no storage in the doors there'd be no you know everything would be around sound and that's just not practical for most people you, the, the amount of compromise you have to do to get a good audio system in a car designed is that's not what people are looking for and it, and it makes sense i just think we're looking out for you know I, we tested a couple ford and gms ford is the biggest uh the the biggest uh, i don't even want to put it this way but they're the ones that charge the most for upgraded audio systems that actually test worse than the base, like the standard ones. They're, wow. they're so overblown. They're horrible. They're just horrible. So like, that's what we're really looking for is like, do you, do you spend, if there's an updated, upgraded audio system, is it actually better worth like 1000, 2000, $3,000 more? And that, that's all we can do is like try to protect people from that. So there's a reference point. Other than that, I mean, it's hard to get into it, but I'm going to, I'm going to get shift into a different question here because sure. Um, I think this goes into it, the personal philosophies in like your business and audio. Um, and I know you started a long time ago and there had to be a reason why you started this, uh, in, you were in an era like early two thousands, right? Something like that. I'm old Mark. I started in 99. I just turned 50. So okay. <laughs> I'm ancient. So yeah. Well, I mean, um, all the audioholics, like when was, when did you kick that off? Yeah, 99 is 99. When I wow. Audio. Okay. Yeah. So you're on the ground yeah. floor and what you what Gene has tried to do from my perspective and I I found him for the very reason I like wanted to do what I wanted to do with car stuff and that is there was a level of trying to be honest where you knew that you still have to keep manufacturers happy, you have to keep the people around <laughs> you happy because you can't just take a dump on a product and expect the brand to be like, "Oh, here you go. You want to test more of our stuff." So there's this slippery slope, but I found that you were one of the few people, at least on the internet, that spun up something where you were trying to be real about a lot of products that you don't need to waste money on. Um, so that's my perception of it. So what's your, how do you fill in the gaps? So the motto on our, and I don't want to shamelessly plug Audio Hawks, but our motto has always been pursuing the truth in audio. And then I changed it to pursuing the truth in audio and video. So I'm trying to get some video in on that. And the whole reason why I started Audio Hawks is when I graduated college as a double E, and I was working in telecom, I was designing, you know, not audio amplifiers, but like wide bandwidth amplifiers. I knew, you know, the properties of amplifiers and what they do and all that stuff. And I started looking at the marketing claims in consumer audio and compared to pro audio and compared to what I do for a living, I'm like, there's so much nonsense in how these manufacturers are specking their products and then I got into the whole cable thing and I could not believe that in consumer audio, there are companies out there that are duping people and putting batteries on cables and charging $5,000, $10,000 for a pair of eight foot cables. And then they're coming up with this butchery of science claiming that they're solving problems that don't really exist. And it's not based on the engineering principles that they're quoting. So I started getting in samples of these cables and... <laughs> I hate to admit this, but I started this when I was working in telecom. I had all access to the test gear there. I started measuring them with magnetic analyzers. I had, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of test gear at my disposal. I'd bring them in at night after I was done work and I'd start measuring and I'd start writing articles. And I started getting attention. I had manufacturers calling me um, a company called Wayne Kerr, believe it or not, is the name of the company. Uh, they sent me a magnetic analyzer. I had audio precision send me test gear. And they're like, we see that you're onto something here. We want to support you, give you the test gear, give you the tools to do the measurements, and then come up with a set of procedures that you think are fair when you're measuring amplifiers or measuring loudspeakers or measuring cables and try to keep the manufacturers honest. And my goal wasn't to give people black eyes per se. My goal was to kind of 
raise the industry up, you know, get to what matters in the industry, have the manufacturers all agree that, hey, we should have a minimal set standard on what is good performance and then get rid of the nonsense, get rid of the snake oil, the stuff that doesn't matter. That's just sucking people's money away that they could be putting into something that matters like room acoustics. Right. And I had a lot of I had a lot of a blowback at first. I've had, you know, companies threatening me because I was writing about their cables and people saying I was never going to make a success in the business because I'm, you know, I'm ruffling too many feathers. But then what really surprised me was the companies that were doing legitimately good product were like, we are all for this. And I had all these engineers behind me. I would get like I would get Christmas cards from Japan, from Yamaha, from the engineers I didn't even know existed because they liked my test reports. And then I started uh, companies started sending me products to do beta testing. So like Denon or Yamaha or just major companies like that would literally send me stuff to test before it released to market. And I was just loving it. This is what this has always been my dream is to be in audio, not to design the stuff, because I know it's a labor of love to design. And I respect the people that design and I always make sure when I measure stuff that I fact check with them that my test reports are accurate. So a lot of these companies would go out and buy the same test gear to match my reporting. So that way we were one to one before I would publish. I always wanted to make sure that I give the best representation for the product and be as accurate as I can. I know I know I always sometimes make mistakes and I do my best to not to minimize those mistakes before we publish. That makes sense. Um, and I, I, I get this question and I think it's becoming more relevant um, in for you and I think for me I'm not going to get into me as much but uh, the way that I wanted to start this was for a lot of the same reasons that you probably did you wanted to see data you wanted to see these things that were not really out there and transparent um, and I get questions a lot from people that want to get into the media space of like the tech space or media space. And I know you, you know, you mentioned like Throttle House and some of these other car people and all these people in social media, they have a voice. Um, and I think the biggest thing is if you're really into something and you're passionate about it, there's an angle to find. And there's mm -hmm. an angle to find when you really like to do something that's not like it, it really takes when you're not happy about something. For me, I was unhappy when I didn't see real transparency with car things. People were never talking about the details. It was always glazed over. So it really charged me to be like, I know how to fill in this space. I know how to do this, but it takes, you know, doing it and actually saying that you want to do it are two different things. And, it, and I, I'm reading more and more about like uh, Gen Z and now Gen Alpha, like they like to watch content. They don't like to create it. So a lot of like what we're doing is becoming the professional resource for people to gather information, to make educated decisions. And when you're talking about it, you know, cars and audio is they're niceties, right? Like they're not, mm -hmm. you're not going to, you're not going to fail in life if you don't have a car or you don't have a nice set of speakers, right? So they're, they're wants versus needs on a lot of cases, but when people are passionate about them and they want to buy them like a car, I take it very seriously. I think, what would I want to know if I was buying a car before I unload, you know, 800 to a thousand dollars a month on like a new car, like on a loan, the same thing with audio gear, right? Like I can't go out when I look at a set of loudspeakers, there's no way, even if I go into a great store, I can't just load up my room full of a bunch of speakers and test them. It's not practical. It's not practical for me to test 10 amps and five receivers and bring in three TVs or three projectors. There's not enough time. There's not enough money and enough resources. So, I think, you know, it's a message for people that are not happy. And this is a segue into another topic. Some people are not happy with our results and what we say in our opinions, which is completely fine. And I charge people to really, if you don't like it and we're doing something wrong, either call us out or give us recommendations or try to start up your own thing, like fill in the mm. gaps where we're not covering, you know, because yeah. it makes us better and you're giving another voice out there for people to, you know, share information and, Maybe we're not doing something right. Like I can't do everything to, in the car world. I can't do everything the same way Throttle House is. We're not funny like them in that traditional way. We have an obscure sense of humor. We're more engineering focused. And we'd fail if we tried to copy their formula, much like they'd be very, it'd be very hard for them to transition to do something like us. So in yeah. your case, 
Um, I thought it was interesting because I've been following like the forum scene for quite a while and what you're trying to do. And I see some of the difficulties in because you've been around for so long. Now there's a new generation of people that are like testing and looking at spec sheets and num the numbers game because they don't have access to the product. They have this wide knowledge base. So how do you deal in the course of your career? like the people now in the, the forum that you're talking about where another they're constantly doing specification tests on all these products and they don't like them and they're garbage. And because you do and you're doing more testing, they're trashing you personally or giving you a hard time. How do you talk to that and how do you deal with that type of stuff? I try to stay off those forums. I've, you know, I've tried to engage them in the past. There's one particular forum that's, that's just like that. They do very heavy measurement centric forum. Um, but it's just, it causes a lot of stress. And I, in my life, as I get older, I try to minimize the stress and I want to focus on family, focus on creating the best content that I can do. And I'm just blessed that I have so many writers and, and people helping me out that are more knowledgeable in certain subjects than I am to get a balanced viewpoint. So I, the only thing I could say to that is when someone goes and trashes a product because of a graph, a CTA 2034 graph is not as pristine as it should, yet they haven't heard the product for themselves. And then they make the opinion that they shouldn't buy the product because of that one graph. I think it's it's doing them a disservice. And I'm going to actually have subject matter experts on our channel to talk about this, that some of these measurements, while the measurements are great, the measurements are for the dating phase, the listening test is for the marriage, right? That's what really ultimately determines if you like the product based on your needs and your room acoustics and your listening environment and listening habits. And I don't think we can just dumb things down to the point where the measurements can tell you everything, especially psychoacoustically. Loudspeakers, the way they play in a room is really hard to understand every aspect of what you're hearing based on a few graphs, as opposed to maybe an amplifier is a, lot, a little easier because it's an electrical signal. You can kind of, you know, if it's an ideal voltage source or not or a piece of wire, you know exactly if it's if it's transmitting that signal without any propagation loss. So I try to keep, I always try to keep the measurements into context. Like I'll measure a processor and it'll have some weird stuff going on in the measurements. But if it's 100 dB below the threshold, it's not something you're gonna hear. It's just not as tidy on the bench. Should you not buy the product because of that, especially if it has really advanced base management or room correction systems that the other product that doesn't have that anomaly? No, that's that's a bad choice. I've I've always said this, get the product integrated into your system and see if it has the feature set you need and how it sounds. So I think there's a balance, there needs to be a balanced approach between having the measurements, holding the manufacturers accountable for the specs that they produce and also being able to do the listening test to see how that translates in your room. Okay. That, that makes sense. And I think there, the parallel that I was trying to draw is the car world is the same, right? I mean, it's gotten worse in the car world because as products get more expensive, the accessibility to the common person becomes lower. And it's, it's a shame because these are passion things. A lot of these cars are passion things and some of them are not, but, um, I see this a lot where the products you can tell are designed by engineers that don't have a lot of time to do it. They have to get it out and they have to be like on, on a bench. A lot of this stuff works, but when you get into the finer details of, um, and I'm, I'm doing this NSX project right now, like trying to finish this documentary that I've said I've had, I'm going to be done in like a year. It's been over a year and I'm going through these technical documents in this book. And one of the things that they talked about during the engineering of this car was, uh, they had this, the, the test driver said, there's something wrong with it. Like it's disconnected. And all the engineers are like, we can't measure this. There's no, mm. there's no data that proves what you're saying is right. So as they went along in development, they found we can't measure the problem that you're having. You have to just turn your brain off to the data for a minute. Stop trying to record everything with sensors or, you know, and drive the car and feel it and just feel it. And you'll start to understand that we need to engineer it two different ways. Uh, in the case of audio, right? It's not just about the feeling of it. It's mm. sitting down and actually turning your brain off and listening to it. And that's one of the things that I found, and I'm nowhere near your level or the people you work with, but I found that I can do a set of like calibrations and measurements and I can get them to the best that I can and setting up the room the best that I can. But at the end of the day, if something looks good on the chart and I sit in my room and I'm like, something's not right. And I will, I will listen more to my ear. Um, it, assuming you have a good ear or understand what you're listening to. I found that to be, 
I will get it to where my ear is happy and the measurements look okay, there might be problems, but I'll be happier with the connection to the equipment and just leaving it alone at that point and stop chasing all the problems and enjoy it. And the same thing with cars. Uh, if you're constantly trying to screw with stuff, uh, you know, I don't like this car because it's not the fastest thing, so now I'm going to trade it to get the next one and the next one and the next one. And I know this is the same thing with audio and video. You know, this TV, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, the black levels aren't this good here and the color, you know, it's on my color meter. It's not, you know, it's not, it, it, there's this endless chase that we get into aside from just being happy with things. Um, and that's a place where you and I, I think because of that experience, we learn it quicker than the average person. So I'm trying yeah. to also, you know, help people understand that. And I've watched your stuff too. And like, you can get really technical, like you get, you guys get really technical, but you also are accessible in the fact that, okay, you don't need to spend 6,000 or 20,000 on a set of speakers to really mm -hmm. get good sound. If your room is not just a horrible, you know, tin can. Um, and I like the way that you guys approach that. So, what if you had to give like advice, uh, just like ABC advice, how would you say if somebody wants to get into audio, kind of like I'm talking about with cars, like what are the first five things that you should do and just off the top of your head? I think the biggest factor in getting good, a good audio experience is the room. So if you're going to stick your speakers in a kitchen <laughs> or you're going to stick it in a family room that's all tile floor and glass, you're not going to get a good experience. It's just really hard. If you don't do anything with the acoustics of the room, I've seen systems. I've gone to people's houses where they spend 10 grand on a pair of Bowers of Wolfen speakers and it's stuck in a, in this horrible room. I measured the RT 60 decay time. It's like a second and a half. It sounds like an echo chamber. You're better off just putting a sound bar in there at that point. If you're not going to yeah. address the room acoustics. So yeah, defining where your listening space is going to be, um, trying to get reasonably good acoustics in there without you know with, while having spousal approval that's step number one then the next step is i <clears throat> i might be a little different than most home theater uh, channels where they focus strictly on multi-channel i'm all about getting the best two channel first and then building a system around it like you can see the speakers behind me those are fully active rbh speakers this is my kind of listening space i even spin records here Every system that I set up in, in my house or when I set up for other people is I make sure I get good imaging from the front sound stage. And I think that's similar in car audio. I'm not an expert of car audio, but I know it's really important to get good sound staging up front. And in the best systems, some of, some of those are just two channel. Like they don't even right. use rear fill, right? If you get a really good DSP tune. So yeah, I would say focus on getting that. But if you're not into music and you just wanna supplement the sound of your TV, so you're watching streaming stuff, then you can go and get a 5.1 or 5.1.4 if you want to get an Atmos. Maybe prioritize less on the quality of the front sound stage so you can have all the speakers. But at the very minimum, I always recommend two subwoofers because in small rooms, in order to get even bass from seat to seat, you can't do that with one sub. You can get good bass in a very narrow area with one sub in a small room or a home theater but having that dual sub configuration really opens things up so that way every seat is eqable and then every seat could sound more consistent so that way if you're sitting on the left of the couch and your wife's sitting on the right of the couch you're both hearing similar bass level and similar bass quality and bass is 30 percent of the experience bad bass you don't enjoy the music and or the home theater um, I, you know, obviously I think the whole concept of, uh, base management has changed quite a bit over the years, you know, like mm -hmm. back in the day before you had all the EQ ability and all the modern software, you know, having one was, you know, most people were never going to have more than one. And now you see like, at least in the audio file, audio file community, there's people talking about four, like the best case four, and then like people are putting them in the ceiling. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. it, it, it's an interesting transition of how things have changed over time. And I, I think that that's, that's the other question I wanted to ask you about this. And I'm going to go over just a couple of things so people aren't lost in the dark with some of this measurement stuff that we're talking about. And I don't want to get in the weeds with it either. But in the past 20 years, what have you seen the biggest change aside from the internet and the business and all the products like in terms of technology what have you seen change and what are the things that are the most disposable also the most garbage things that have happened so i think the industry in general as a whole is improving right i mean 20 years ago you couldn't go out to monoprice and buy a pair of 600 speakers that actually performed decently 
it was hard to get a pair of good floor standing $600 speakers back then. So I think because of companies like Harman that did the research that showed, hey, this is kind of a recipe for a good sound. You know, this is how a speaker should behave in a room. More people started researching this, other brands as well. And they got more serious about not just voicing a speaker by ear, but doing the measurements first, getting a good blend of the drivers, and then of course doing listening tests. And in general, I just think loudspeaker performance has gotten better over the years, subwoofers especially. I mean, I'm talking 20 years ago when I started this whole thing, you know, it was hard to get good deep bass and the subwoofers did not perform, the drivers didn't perform as the way they do now. There's just so much lower distortion. You've got the ability to EQ and get rid of the bumps in the bass that was very hard to do. I mean, just 15 years ago, a flagship den and receiver had one subwoofer output, it had a GEQ on it. You couldn't do a lot of bass stuff. You had to go and buy a mini DSP and tag it onto your receiver and fix the bass in your room. Well, now you could do that with room correction. Now you could do that with a lot of subwoofers that have built-in room correction. So I think in general, that aspect has improved. The things that, that kind of bother me about how the industry has changed in the last couple of years is, is the branding and the labeling of stuff like Dolby Atmos. Like now you could get Dolby Atmos in, in a computer, in a laptop. You can get it in a $400 sound bar. It's like they've watered down what the Atmos experience is. And I understand why they're trying to commercialize it and bring it out there so more people get into it. But at the same time, I feel like it takes something away from the magic. If, if someone's only exposure to Dolby Atmos is through a sound bar or through bouncy house speakers, the one that flecked up to the ceiling, they're not getting the whole picture. They're not really getting the full immersive effect. So the other problem too with that is as you add more features to products like AVRs, the, the, the $1,000 AVR from 20 years ago had a much bigger power supply and capability than a thousand dollar AVR today, because now you're paying licensing fees to Dolby, you're paying licensing fees for HDMI 2.1 to get 8K uh, switching in there. Anytime you add these new features into a product, you're gonna have to cut what matters most for sound quality, and that's the power supply or the amplification section. So that's why I started this whole truth in power campaign a few years ago keeping them accountable for measurements and amplifiers because they started measuring amplifiers rather than FTC. I'm trying, I'm trying not to get too in the weeds with your audience, yeah, no, but I got, I got you. in the seventies, the FTC did full bandwidth power ratings for two channels driven eight ohms, four ohms. Well, if you look at the fine print on a lot of these cheap AVRs today, they measure it at one channel driven at one kilohertz at 10% at six ohms. So it gives you the illusion of more power. And there's just so many caveats. So you look at this receiver, it says 250 watts a channel. The reality is it's more like 90 or 100 watts a channel. It's about half of what they're showing. And I just wish manufacturers would be more honest about that with people. So like you go into the Best Buy and you get one of these home theater boxes and it says like 2000 yeah. watts. It's like PIMPO, which is like some dynamic BS power rating. It's not even close to that. So. That's the, those are the kind of things that seem like they've gotten a little bit worse in the industry since we've added Atmos and we've added more channel counts to products. But in general, I think products are getting better, especially the loudspeakers and subwoofers and room correction. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a valid point because I, you see that um, it's not just, yeah, obviously it's that makes sense in the audio video space because you're you're trying to take something and make it new to people. So it's the marketing magic of trying to get more people in. Um, while things have changed, they haven't changed all that much. And you see the same thing with cars, right? Like the cars that, what made people excited for cars 20 years ago was a driving experience, right? It was about mm -hmm. the physicality, the connectedness of the car. And now you look at a modern car um, and it's about how isolated is it? How much can we isolate the driving experience out? And then what's the technology? That's the primary goal of like, you know, our younger buyers want screens. Our younger buyers want infotainment because they are holding their phone. And the first thing to get them in is, oh, I feel comfortable because I see a screen in the car. And I'm not kidding you. That's exactly what they've, the manufacturers tell us point blank. It's not made up. So it's this switch of how do you make an old thing new? Um, and yeah. they're constantly trying to recreate this. And, um, you know, as I do more and more work on the back end, talking to engineers, talking to people, designers and the business side, all these things have to come together, right? If it was all engineering, this car would, a car or a product would be, you know, ridiculous and it wouldn't be accessible to, you wouldn't sell them, right? 
That's the same thing yeah. with cars, right? If you, if you made a, a car um, that was the perfect car from an engineering driving perspective, you'd have five people that would buy it, you know, and that's the joke. Um, but it's gotten to, it's, it's another extreme too, where you're, you're selling all this marketing versus actually having a product that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I found that too, over getting back into audio video again, and obviously with the help of your site is, you know, what are most people doing? Most people are, you know, listening to basic two channel audio, mostly compressed. Most people are watching stuff through a TV. They don't have like a dedicated AVR, let alone the space for all these speakers. And then what's their streaming source or their source to get content? Mm -hmm. They're not going to be like discreet, like really high quality, um, multi-channel outputs. Most people have like a generic app thing on their TV or a Roku and the audio is limited there. What are you going to do with it? So when you talk about hi-fi right like a really good two channel system i feel like to your point that's the most accessible way to do it um because you at least you have really good control of two channel and no matter what you watch or listen to you can get yeah. sound and set it up out of a two, two speakers um obviously with tv and movies a center and that's going to be a huge argument i see people arguing about center channel all the time it's like a blessing and a curse when you mm -hmm. hear a good setup with a center channel when everything comes out of it because so much data comes through there it can make a huge difference in terms of dialogue legibility and all of that. And I, I feel like even like a three channel setup for TV and movies is pretty good. But when you get into all the, you know, like when you start talking about Atmos and you start talking about like four subs or three or, you know, how, you know, however you're going to do it, it gets to the point where how it's am I going to do this? Up. Yeah. Yeah. You're not yeah. going to convince an average person to go set this up in a space that most people don't have in modern homes, especially. And this is where I've struggled and I'm, I'm not going to talk to death, but I'm going to get back into like how I got back into this and re got reconnected with Audioholics. But I, I loved audio as a kid. Um, my dad loved movies and TV and he knew nothing about how to set anything up. I was like an eight year old plugging in RCA cables and a mess and setting up like a preamp and all this crap. I had no idea. There was no internet either. And I just, I liked that part of it. But as I got older and into it, I realized where the hell am I going to set this stuff up? I had an apartment. Mm. Okay. Now you can't play it loud or, you know, you have to be careful. And what can you do with the room? Not much. And then, you know, I'm looking for a house and every new house is like a cavern to find a room that is the proper size in a pre-built home is almost impossible because of the high ceilings and everything. And then you get to the point of like, what you're saying is I could get a mono bright speaker, not to say that there's not anything wrong with it, but something that's like $300, then it's going to sound just as good as like a $2,000 set of speakers in a, a room with a 20 foot ceiling. It's just, yeah, it's really yeah, that's hard. A... Sorry, sorry. That, that, that was kind of my point. No, it's, it's, it's really it's... hard to get people into it. The room, the room and the difficulty and setup. Look, we're not at the point where you can just plop down a five channel with a subwoofer speaker system and press a magic button and have it perfectly calibrated. We are there are some systems that do a decent job that that get you close and some people will be satisfied with that. But there is some setup and that, that's why I think it's important to work with a partner if you're buying from a retailer that actually has technical expertise. Sometimes it's worth the extra money to pay the retail price and get customer support as opposed to shopping for the for the cheapest you can get it from someone that doesn't even know the products they're just basically reselling it and i think that's why there should be a connection with the dealer even if it's an online deal there are some great online companies that are offering service they're offering expertise on the products and i think that's what really helps people get better into it because half of it is getting the setup you get the good equipment yeah. in there but if it's improperly set up, you're not getting the results that you were hoping for. Yeah, and the TV stuff is the same way as you know. Like I, I I've cursed this for a long time. And I obviously making videos, uh, I have a really good ear for video and audio. Great. I grew up with this stuff, so I'm like, okay, now I get to make it or somewhat try to make it. And I have a better appreciation for everything that goes into it. I also have appreciation for the fact that I could spend all this time on calibrated displays like color calibration, trying to get audio calibrated and make making a mix and a video that looks as accurate as I can possibly make it to, to do what I want to do. And then, you know, you don't know what people are watching. And I look at the the analytics for YouTube and surprisingly, our, our viewer base is like almost half they watch on a TV, which is unbelievable. Wow. Uh, so a lot of people do watch our stuff on TVs. Um, and a lot of people are clearly more enthusiast based, but 
The other half are watching on a computer or a phone screen, so you don't know what color profile they're in. They could be on a color profile that's completely incompatible. It would look horrible based on how I did it. So the magic of trying to get something set up only to have the end user with a product they don't understand and it goes into, you know, 100, 700 hertz mode or 7,000 hertz on their TV with, you know, frame blending and all this stuff that ruins the picture and that nobody knows the difference either. Like, people don't have a good ear or eye because there's never been any real standardization because if yeah. there was solid standardization in products, you wouldn't be able to sell them, right? So it kind of goes back to that question of, you know, the gimmicky part of trying to solve this marketing to make it look cool, like, oh, I sold a laptop with Dolby Atmos. Wow, people are like, okay, it's got Dolby Atmos. I don't even know what the hell that is, but it, it's a feature that they can try to sell as a value add. Um, and the car market is egregious with this too. It's the same thing with the market, the, the type of nonsense that they're, um, that they're trying to push. Um, yeah, like the, like the paddle side. shifters. Like, do we really need paddle shifters on our steering wheel? I mean, they, oh, hello? Yeah, sorry. Oh. Can you still hear me? My audio. I can hear you. I just can't see you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, it, my uh, somebody's listening to me on the back end, and they're like, "Nope, you're not. You're not going to talk about us." Uh, I'm going to try to restart my webcam. And I think it crashed. Okay. So I'll I'll get into the next question. Um, is why you can't see me. I'm just a black void. Um, your biggest well, I was mistakes gonna... and lessons. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to finish one point that I, because you asked me about some of the downfalls recently in home theater. And I think one of the biggest blows to home theater in the last few months is the fact that the retailers like Best Buy are not supporting Blu-ray anymore. So if people's only experience for home theater is streaming, they're really missing out because there's a huge difference in sound quality between streaming, whether you, whether it's an Apple TV or a Roku Disney Plus, all that stuff, there's always compromises in the audio quality because it's compressed. And the streaming versions of these movies either have limited dynamic range, limited bass extension, or they have a lot more compression in the high channels. So I would really encourage anyone that has a home theater to, to get a Blu-ray player at the very minimum, buy their favorite movie if it's an Atmos, or if you have the budget, a Kaleidoscape is the way to go. That's just the only way you're going to get reference material now because streaming just hasn't caught up. Until we get lossless audio and until we don't get different compromised mixes for streaming, you're never going to get the full experience that you got in the, in the movie theater watching a movie on streaming. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And just, just so, I'm going to ask you, can you still hear me clearly and see me? Yeah. Okay, all right, cool. I, I, yeah, I, I would agree with that. The streaming thing, it's, it's, it is amazing, honestly. And I know you know this when you're working all the time and you're doing stuff, the last thing you're going to be able to do, and this is really hard for me, is go to a theater or sometimes it's just convenient to be able to stream anything you want. Like, I want to see it. It's right there. And I'm willing to sacrifice some of the quality to see it right then and there. But it, it, it does take away some of the magic. Namely, um, I think when you look at HDR or not HDR, but uh, UHD discs, which I know nobody uses. Like it's probably gotta be like a 1% of the market share. But mm -hmm. I, I, my dad collects all these movies and he has like all these movies he doesn't even open. He's just a collector of movies and he loves them. And I, now that I've gotten older, I never really understood it as much as I like it. I'm like, why do you have all this stuff that you've never opened? And he's like, I, I, you know, I collection. like it. Yeah. It's a collection. And now that I'm older, I'm like, I want all of it, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go in and just loot his house, but you know I mean? Like when, when he's gone in a hundred years, uh, cause he's going to live forever. I, you know, I would like to take and make a room just for physical, that physical media. Um, and I think when you go and as you know, you, you take a UHD disc and you compare it to the streaming, like the same thing, even in a 4k stream, it's, it's not even close, um, yeah. in terms of picture quality, but you know, if you get used to it, right, like you can still enjoy it. And I think that's the balance of it. Oh, yeah. You don't need a, you don't need a $300,000 sports car to enjoy the driving experience. Right. So that's the same thing goes with audio and video. Um, and I will go into the next question. I've had it up here. What do you think your, your biggest mistakes and lessons are that you've learned in the, the decades of doing this now? <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes running a website without a marketing degree or anything like that. I would say um, the biggest one was in the early 2000s. I tried to brand a store with Audioholics and I was, I guess I was ahead of the, uh, 
I was ahead of its time because now everybody does affiliate, right? So I try to I try to bring a partner in and run an online store that it was independent from Audio Hawks, but they would use my name and they would sell brands with click to buy on the reviews. And people did not like that. Our readers didn't like it. We pissed off our advertisers if they weren't included in the store. And it just it created a mess for a couple of years. And then that company wouldn't let go of my name afterwards when I dissolved the partnership. And that was a mess in its own. Um, I'm glad that that chapter is over, but then all of a sudden in the last few years, you can't survive without affiliate. All the YouTube channels are monetized. They're all run with, with channel partners. Everybody's monetizing their websites. You know, it's not just banners anymore. The, man, the advertisers don't really want the banners. They don't see the value in branding anymore. They want click to buy. They want links embedded in the YouTube videos. And it's there's pressure there because now you have to perform you have to get enough views in order for those clicks to work based on the numbers game. So that's kind of changed the game a little bit. And I, and the other thing I see is um, other mistakes I've made is I just didn't focus sometimes on, I worry too much about where the next revenue stream was going to come in and not just have faith that the content itself would win, you know, and just, those kind of challenges. I, I would always think like at, during COVID, I was like, oh man, my business is ruined. I lost 60% of my advertising because everybody pulled out. I was like, how am I going to recover? And then yeah. sure enough, I had no idea there'd be a resurgence in home theater because people weren't going to the theaters. Right. They were building home theaters in their houses. So post COVID was the best few years we've had. I just and, couldn't yeah, foresee that, that. That's amazing. Yeah. Do you think people have a better appreciation for it now? hundred uh, percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Every, I mean, I talk to friends of mine that are installers and their business is all boomed after COVID because of that. People are putting dedicated listening spaces. Look what happened after COVID. The movies went direct to stream, right? HBO max had all the new movies. I was loving that. I was like, man, I hope this doesn't end. Of right. course it ended because people are going yeah. back to the theater. But for a while that was like just a cool feature to get a brand new release literally when it was coming out on stream. And that's something we've talked about forever, you know, that's always been teased the services that were going to allow you a direct to home theater theatrical release. And I forgot what company it was it was like a $20,000 box or subscription that you could do that a long time ago. And I remember going with my dad back in the oh, was it Divix or the, something. Yeah, I think it, I think it was that. Yeah. I remember going to CES or some of the electronic shows when I was a kid and my dad, I remember walking with him. I was probably six years old and we were in Chicago and um, we went to all these like, you know, the, the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, hotel setups for all the listening rooms they did in Chicago. And yeah, I remember listening to like a set of Thiel speakers and some of these other ones and we're walking home and my dad's like, one day you're going to have HD TV in your generation. One day you're going to have this stuff and you're going to see movies at home without having to go to the theater. And it's funny how it's still you know, some of these prophecies have not been fulfilled and it makes sense, right? That's a big business. You're not gonna, you can't have one streaming service with every uh, brand on it. So, so you're now it's worse than cable was. You have to have 75 streaming services to get, you know, where is that one movie on? Oh, yeah, no, it's more money than, to. yeah, it's more, I mean, I have, I'm subscribed to like all the streaming services. And when I look at my monthly bill, I'm like, this is way more money than I paid for yeah. cable. And, and you it's some not even, of them like still, half of them are not even good. Like yeah, and you still get commercials. You still get commercials yeah. on some of them. Like Hulu, you got to spend almost twenty a month if you don't want the commercials. I love yeah, American Dad, but do I want to spend twenty a month because I don't want commercials? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, uh, and yeah, I know. I saw Amazon is now doing ads. I mean, it makes sense, right? These companies. If they can't get enough content, they need to to, to get the money to keep the the, the business rolling. Um, so I don't know. It's a slippery slope. I, I think we're reaching a, a point of saturation now with streaming. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Like as these services fall by the wayside, um, when there's too much, cause people can't afford to be spending $40 or tw like the prices keep going up 20, 40, 50, or like Hulu is like $80 with DVR. It's, it's crazy. It but, is. Um, yeah. But don't you yeah. think it changed the way it, it changed the way we we digest content now in, in my opinion and i don't want to get too far off topic movie quality has suffered over the last few years i think that everything is recycled plots gender swapping and i everything seems to be the good stories are going to stream 
but then they hook you because you have to watch serialized content. So you, right. you start on a show and you got to watch all the seasons to see how it concludes. You can't just jump from one episode to the other. So I just think the way we've consumed our media has changed since COVID particularly. Yeah, it's gone down quite a bit. And I'm not saying that because I'm, you know, middle aged white guy that everybody says shouldn't have an opinion anymore. Um, yeah, in media space, right, especially when it comes to um, movies and film, right? Like the, the concept of if I say something bad about a movie, well, that's not for you, right? I, I mean, I get that. I'm, I think more, there is so much creativity, and there's so much talent out there. Um, but I really do think it comes down to what makes money, right? Like the studios don't want to dump a hundred million dollars on a movie if it's not going to make triple that back. So yeah, they're trying to say with st safe topics. Um, that said, there is an unbelievable amount of great like TV. I mean, more so than ever. Um, you look at like The Last of Us, which you know is I a video that. game. You know, I mean, yeah. like literally took a video game, which was a good story to begin with, to be fair. Yeah. But they translated it perfectly into a story you care about, like, and it wasn't. It was just different. There's a lot of shows like that, and we could go on and on and talk about TV and movies. But I feel like it's gotten better. But I think the mass commercial stuff has gotten worse. Um, and but that, to be fair, that's also like the the burnout effect of uh, the superhero stuff. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> been played out for years anyway. Yeah. yeah. No, but I want know, like I want Barbie, movies right? like the Sha I want movies like the Shawshank Redemption again. We're just not yeah. getting movies to that level anymore. Now everything everybody has to fly, and it's all action, yeah. and it's just not deep character development. Yeah, and. and I think there's a lot there's a lot more competing for your eyes and ears now too um you know like i i talked about the, i talk about this a lot with media space because you have to go back 50 years and there was like three five channels right five tv channels and your media was really consolidated your messaging was really consolidated or you know you'd pick up a newspaper and like oh okay i have three choices for a newspaper in my town and that's where you consumed everything now you're mm -hmm. inundated with so much like from all these spaces and streaming services and online sites and uh it's going to get worse i think generationally with the the concept of quick you know like the TikTok style um there's just just constant scrolling stuff i think the attention span is also going to deplete i don't know how long form is going to do with that generational shift will the well, will the younger generation get more calmed down to want to watch longer stuff what's your feeling on that well, my scary, here's what scares me is the reason why I got on YouTube is I saw the decline of people reading online mm. and wanting to digest content on YouTube. So back in our heyday, we had our, our editorial site had twice the traffic that it has today and it still does well, but it had twice the traffic. All that shifted over to YouTube. So our YouTube channel has about the same traffic now as our editorial site, which is crazy. Yeah. But it's the trend is getting worse now. People are going like you said to TikTok, and the attention spans are getting shorter and shorter, and they just don't want to read like they used to. And I'm right. guilty of it myself. When I go online and I want to find out about a new car or whatever, I don't go and read the article. I go right to YouTube and look up channels like yours or Throttle House, and it's just more entertaining, right? You want to yeah. watch it from your TV. So I think there needs to be a balance of that. And but I'm just not seeing it. Like I look at my kids and they're not reading the content. They're on TikTok yeah. and they're on YouTube and that's how they're digesting the information. So I don't really know what the answer is to that other than supplementary. So when I do a video on Audioholics, I do put the editorial in more detail if people want to read it, but I always promote my YouTube channel back to my website to try to keep that thing going. I, th I think there's certain topics that lend well to written format and supplemental like to your point audio video stuff it's it's really hard you're, you're never going to be able to show somebody what a speaker sounds like right it's impossible yeah. i mean you can show the speaker and take it apart and like here's the engineering that goes in it which would serve well from a video format but frankly i don't want to watch a 20 minute review to see a bunch of graphs right it would make more sense to have it written out and it's your, well, what scares doing, me right? about YouTube as well is there's people on YouTube with binaural microphones letting you listen to the speaker through your Beats headphones or your little desktop speakers yeah. thinking you're getting the same experience. And it's such right. a disservice. It's so dishonest intellectually. It's entertaining, yeah. but it's a, it's just bad form. You cannot do a listening test through YouTube 
uh, and hear a speaker at someone else's house and get it's, the same it's funny though forget. it's <laughs> funny but people take it seriously I, I get people arguing with me like you talk 20 minutes about that speaker you never shut up and you never let you never let us hear the speaker i'm like am i going to sit here and let you hear a twenty thousand dollar pair of perlis and speakers on your earbuds and think you're going to get that experience you're going to hear what i'm hearing and you think the microphones are going to accurately represent the acoustic space and what's going on with the speaker versus what's going on with the acoustics and transfer it back to your speakers it just it doesn't happen so it's hard to play in a space like that um and to kind of reconnect the car world and the product tech world and the speaker world right it's really hard to explain some of these complicated topics without talking down to people right i think that's that's yeah. the other thing that we face we get a lot of this like oh you guys are pretentious you know and it, it it's hard to help people learn while not talking over them and making them feel dumb mm -hmm. right because that's what happens with this stuff and i like i listen to your stuff i don't ever feel stupid listening to it but i'm like i have no idea what the hell you're talking about and you know it takes a lot of work to like get caught up with that but at the same time you know like you have to have a middle ground of trying to help people understand what you're saying without going over their head, but also not dumbing it down and watering down the content to the point of like, I don't want to make TikTok videos where I have 30 seconds to show a dashboard, steering wheel, a tire and a wheel and look how cool it is. Um, I don't care about that. And I, I, I know there's that game of trying to do that. Um, namely in the audio space too, like, look how cool it is. You've dealt with that forever. Like, look at the finish or oh, look at the specs, look how much wattage or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a place that you exist. And I know you said this and it hit me when you first said it is you're, you've maxed out what you can do with the audio video realm of your business. Like there's nothing left. You've achieved what you went out to do. So how do you, how is that, how's that changed for you knowing that um, personally, has it evaporated your joy in it? Like what it, what do you, how do you deal with it day to day? So there was a period a few years ago where I was just burned out. Like, uh, there was, I would go to trade shows. I'm like, I've already heard it all. I'm not interested in this. And it's like, I've seen it all. I've had so many products in my house, but then I self-reflected and I realized personally, I was having some struggles of my own. Like I was dealing with some depression and I just wasn't getting excited about things. So then I, after I treated that and I went through my own personal journey, it kind of re um, ignited my passion for audio. And then I got more people involved. That's, that's the thing is getting, getting more people involved in what you do. I hired new writers, people that have fresh perspectives, you know, getting on YouTube and getting the reaction out of people and then going to trade shows. And when people recognize you and they, you know, they're appreciative of your efforts, it kind of gave me like a new appreciation and a, that I'm so privileged and honored to have that I'm able to reach so many people on these platforms and, and help people make better purchasing decisions, kind of like what you're doing as well, that it's kind of, I'm excited about it now. I look forward, like I saw at CES, they had those translucent TVs from LG. I mean, that's like, yeah. that's Tony Stark level stuff. You know, that's stuff that we saw in Avengers 10 years ago that are now coming to fruition. Or the fact that we now have the ability to do multi-managed sub room correction that I was dreaming about 20 years ago that I had to do manually. So there, the fact that there's progress gives me hope. And I see that um, younger generations are getting more into audio in terms of, even if they're listening with earbuds, they are paying attention to listening. And the fact that Apple Music puts so much effort into spatial audio, I never thought we'd see the day where we would be streaming surround sound music. That's, you know, sit back and think about that. 10 years ago, that was an, an impossibility. You could not do that. You had to go and buy physical discs to do that. So the fact that a major company like Apple is investing in spatial audio gives me hope that there's future for this and that there's, we just got to reach the younger generation because when us old farts die out, well, yeah. me, I'm talking about, you're, you're, you're younger than me. But when, when I die out, my generation has to pass that passion on to the next generation. Yeah, I think that's and super important. And you have to reach those people, yeah. I, I think it is really super important, and it's one of the things that uh, dr drives me more now. Um, I, I And I mentioned this before, and I mean, I, it's just because I've been working on it with this NSX thing, and um, 
I, I'm sitting here thinking to myself how much work I'm doing, like trying to trying to get this video done and like all the things that go into it. And part of it after a while is a car is a car, but you know, after a while, this knowledge goes away. And this is what I told the engineers, like they're all, you know, and there's some of sixties and seventies, right? They're, they're been retired. And I told them, you know, once you're gone and this knowledge is not shared, it's not relearned. You know, the, the past yeah. lessons are gone. So what is it that, you know, for me, I didn't create these things I, to, like, to your point, like I've spent my entire life supporting product or fixing things that are wrong with things that are people creating or trying to make them better for the people that are creating them. So a lot of my job is to try to share some of these stories and some of the knowledge that has gone into them. So people have a better appreciation of that. And that's what gets me excited. And it's more rare, let's be real, because most of the products are just shit out. You know, they really are. They're just quick. Let's get them out. We need to sell a lot in high volume. But there are products out there that really get you excited and you want people to learn and understand. And there's so much fun to be had with that. And if I can pass along even other people's work, um, that's really that's the best thing I can do at this point with what I'm trying to do. Um, and ha have you I know you talk to a lot of people. You talk to a lot of engineers that do audio and video. Um, how is it, is it mostly just the people that are working in these smaller companies that you have access to? How do you view the small versus the big commodity brands? No, that's what, that's what another thing that really blows me away is, is even though our channel's not as nearly as big as yours, we are watched by people I don't realize are watching us. I, I had an interview with a guy that did the uh, Atmos mixing for the Star Wars movies. He was a fan of my channel. I had no idea. We gave him some consultation because he's making a mixing studio in his house and he's going to be producing content on it. So that kind of stuff is amazing. I had most recently last summer, I had uh, Yamaha reach out to me and their lead designer in Japan for their hi-fi division wanted to come out, visit me, showcase his new products, sit down with me, listen to music. And we spent two days together and th this dude was awesome. I mean, this is the guy that's designing the very best audio equipment that Yamaha makes, hanging out with me, drinking sake, listening yeah. to blues music. I mean, I just, this is why I do what I do. You know, I, the fact that I'm able to have these kind of relationships and, and influence these companies because they listen to what I say when I find an anomaly in their product, they go and make changes. So it's not just the small companies, which I do work with as well, but the large companies pay attention. I mean, large companies like uh, Mar Marantz and Denon have made major changes to their products because of my testing. And loudspeakers too. We have a guy that does all of our loudspeakers, James Larson. He's incredibly resourceful. He takes the speakers outside to do accurate measurements. When he does this stuff, the manufacturers watch it and if there's problems they try to make improvements to the products the good companies do that yeah you know and that's so that's that's just an awesome thing and I, and i just have to tell you the fact that you keep talking about this nsx project the fact that you sit in that car and drive it that's like a dream of mine i would love to drive that car that's a beautiful car that must be awesome yeah it's um i think a lot of these like nsx specifically uh jack and i started doing a video on it like a year ago and like oh i, I want to do it like a documentary style thing and then we interviewed people that su bent, spent their business supporting this car most of their adult life like literally servicing and supporting it and supporting the owner community and i'm like i cannot tell a story about this car without getting the japanese involved because this is what we do as a, in a, as americans or in the united states we 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 get these products and we spin our own stories on them and we make it like it's our own and we don't get to hear from the people that actually worked on them and i knew i'm mm -hmm. like okay how old are these guys when can i get you know can i get a hold of them you know like and i made the mistake open up opening up that door and um i was not prepared for the door that i opened uh however it's probably the this is like most things with life right like the hardest things you do, the most difficult things you do, whether you enjoy them or not, the silver lining is usually you learn a lot from it. And oh yeah, I, and I know you know this. Going through difficulties and running a business, and you you learn from mistakes or even not mistakes. You just learn by having to do more than you normally would have done, um, and you learn what you did go good and what you can do better next time and what you would never do again. But I really love. Um, it, it to me, it's 
way beyond the car at this point, way beyond the driving the car and all that. And it's more about how these things come about, like the stories behind the people and how they were. And this was their life. You know, literally yeah. some of these dudes that made this this specific car, and it could be any car, to be honest, some of these big cars, they've dedicated almost their entire adult life. This was their one achievement that they had mm -hmm. in their generation and their life. That's the biggest thing that they did. And a lot of the Japanese especially tie a lot of their identity to that thing that they did over anything else. And I find that sad, but I also find it very fascinating and compelling that somebody put this much energy into something. And I have a lot of respect for that because we're so spread out, right? Like I know you and I were in a million different directions, but if I had yeah. to dedicate to one thing and that one thing was this car that you know, people are still talking about. It's like the closest thing you can come to like an art piece or something that hopefully will live on long after you're gone. So it, it's it's cool. Um, there's not too many products that you can talk about that you can pass that stuff on. And I'm sure in the audio video space, you know, there's some historic pieces of equipment uh, that people think about and talk about, but it's probably less than some of these historic cars, I would, would think. Do you, is that I mean, there's classic, there's classic designs. There's gold standards of what audiophiles consider to be products that are timeless, right? Like JBL has the L100, which when it came out back in the day, it wasn't a very good speaker, but it was kind of the gold standard. And JBL actually brought that speaker back with modern engineering. And it's a much better speaker now with updated driver tech and a waveguide. But yeah, I mean, there's, there is some of that. There's The funny thing is some of this audio nostalgia is what really drives uh, the appreciation for that, like old Macintosh okay. gear, old Macintosh gear sells for more now than it was sold for when you bought it in the seventies. And so it's, I mean, it's beautiful stuff with the blue, uh, front glass and the VU meters. Yeah. But on a bench, some of this stuff isn't that great. It's certainly not worth the amount of money that they're asking for. It's almost like a piece of jewelry at that point, you know, but that's, that's how it is. The, the perception, it's not always, it's not always about the measurements. It's not always about the performance. It's about the perception and how you connect to the product that really matters. And you could connect with something like a Macintosh product over like a Denon receiver, you know, Denon or so mass market right. product. You don't get that kind of emotional connection. And that, that's a big part of, of your experience with audio and video is the emotional connection to seeing the product in the room. And um, I don't think uh, some of the manufacturers that that really push the blind listening test to remove the bias, they don't always factor in the fact that you have to live with the product in a room. And if you have something that sounds good in a room, but also looks good, yeah. that changes your whole perception of how you experience it. And I'm imagining the same thing with cars. I look at some of the cars today and i look at like what bmw did with that beaver grill that yeah. kills me that i just won't i won't trade my m240 for a car that has that big grill on the front and i don't know why they're doing it but that's everybody's doing that lexus did that with the is i had the is 350 which in black looked okay but those grills yeah. keep getting bigger and and it's a design choice i guess that the industry kind of stuck with but it created a very polarized result, right? I think there's a lot of BMW enthusiasts that prefer the older designs over the new designs for that reason. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, discussion with the car stuff and the car design um, because cars are weird in the fact that they have multi, people have them for multiple reasons, right? They can be a vanity piece. They can mm -hmm. be a flex. They can be, you know, a status piece. They can be an A to B machine that's like a toaster. You know, uh, some people are enthusiasts. They just love the car. They don't care how it looks. Um, so there's so many reasons why people buy cars. But yeah, I, I think you know, what struck me is there's, and when we did our, we did this video with the Lucid Air Sapphire and the engineers and the guys that we talked to and girls, they were, they had some interesting things to say. And one of the, the brand managers, he's like, you know, we've gone through this evolution of additive design big grills, uh, add on pieces for the sake of it, non-functional pieces. And now you're starting to see that reverse itself. So it's, again, it rolls in trends, right? Like you talked about the JBLs, like they're re releasing a, a heritage or a legacy speaker and improving it. So there's these trends that we go on. Um, and I think the BMW thing is interesting because, you know, all the BMWs for a long time looked the same, like that generation, True. like after, you know, they were all the same. And what does every other brand do? They copy, that formula so bmw's 
And I remember doing one of the first couple of BMW videos, like the problem with BMW is everybody else has done what they've done. So it's been copied out to the point where they no longer feels and looks special. So I think they picked up, and I'm not saying it has anything to do with, you know, that mentality, but I think they picked up on it and they're just like, we're no longer going to be copied. We need to throw all that out and just be seen. So you look at the XM, that SUV. I don't know if you know what that is. It's like the... the uh, no, it's it's the V8 one. Basically, it's oh. like an X7 size, uh, hideous. <laughs> um, I'm gonna put this up here just for a second. Anyway, it's it's an SUV um, that is just disgusting, and <laughs> it kind of sums up what this is happened to this brand um I, I i'm assuming you can see my screen hopefully yeah okay so it, it just takes what you hate oh gosh and, yeah please and, and turns it into like amplifies it right and somebody, so much bling and, so much bling yeah. that's not needed for the brand in my opinion yeah <laughs> well here's here's a perfect example right like somebody had to make an active decision um <laughs> Now, somebody had to make that active decision that it was like a big middle finger, right? Like, we're going to be seen, yeah. I have the money, and I want to be different. And in some cases, I don't think it's working, but in other cases, I think it will help. And I think it's going to help other companies stand, step aside or, you know, separate themselves. And, you know, yeah. obviously, it's not for you or I. Clearly, I don't like that, but some people do. It's weird. Well, that's um, what kills me about like the M240. I have the 2018 and the new version is, is a lot faster because mostly because it has all wheel drive. Right. But I don't like the design cues. It like, it doesn't blend like the rear tail lights look like the sloth from ice age. And right, yeah, yep. It, it's just gawky and it's too, the car's bigger yet there's less space in the back seat. So I'm confused. What is it trying to be? Is it a sports car? Is it a sedan? I, I don't know. I didn't, I never drove it. I never compared it to my 240, but my 240 and maybe I'm biased cause I own it, but it's kind of a timeless car. It's like when the one series came out, it was too small. It didn't look right, but the two series had the right proportions. And if you get the M2, which I couldn't afford at the time, the M2 is gorgeous because it has, yeah. it's wider. It's like almost like an M4, but it has the, it also has the older engine. It doesn't have the B58 or at least the right. old M2 didn't. Yeah, and that, that becomes the problem. You know, you get the, the newer car with the better tech, well, in some cases, better technology, better performance, and then, you know, you get saddled with the, the horrific modern styling of, or, you know, again, the trendy styling of what, what is required from the, the current generation. Uh, and I know you said, you know, like the Macintosh connection, and I just thought to myself, I'm like, I know the exact thing for you uh, as a Macintosh fan, uh, get the new Jeep Wagoneer with the Macintosh audio system in there. It's, it's a game changer for sure. <laughs> I saw that at one of the trade shows. Yeah. I saw that. Oh my God. It's a big oh. plate on the big face plate on the front. Yeah. Yeah. The digital face plate. Yeah. We, uh, when we tested that, I think it was probably one of the worst audio systems we had ever tested. Uh, I heard the, that the too. Base, yeah. base curve was like, I can't draw it, but it was like here. <laughs> And then it comes down, you know, I mean, it was, I, I don't know what they did. I have no idea why they did it. Somebody made a clear decision to do it. It wouldn't have slipped through, but yeah, it was horrendous. Um, and Macintosh is an of, interesting company because they have an amazing heritage. You know, they're an American company. They've been around forever. And I, it, this is my personal opinion. I thought they made some good speakers back in the day in the seventies and eighties. They, they had a guy, Roger Russell, that was largely involved and he did some great stuff, but I feel like in the modern years when they came out with these large line arrays they just they got a good deal on these two inch drivers that were probably desktop P, uh, pc speakers and they just put 20 or 30 of them in this big array with big woofers behind them and every time i listened to them when it was at a trade show even in an acoustically controlled room there was just no sense of cohesion to the sound it was just like a wall of sound and then they just bragged about how much power was behind it with all their big amplifiers and I don't know if it's because they're appealing to the older audiophile, older than me. And as you get older, obviously your hearing declines and they're just trying to make a speaker that's big and bold for them. But I feel like a company like them with all their resources and all their heritage, they could be doing loudspeakers much better than they're doing them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. 
I, I think the expectation level goes up when you have the level of expertise and heritage in a brand. Um, yeah. It's a blessing and a curse, right? Because the expectation goes up like, hey, you're one of the best at this. You should be able to do it right. And I don't know that that's really, if you don't have the right people to do it and some of the right leadership of deciding what you're going to do or have a clear vision in terms of products like that, sometimes it just it's better off not doing it <laughs> if you're not going to yeah. really do it right sometimes. Um, but well, yeah, there's been companies, there's been subwoofer companies that try to make loudspeakers. Validine tried to make loudspeakers. They were atrocious. Uh, JL Audio tried to make loudspeakers for the home and it didn't work out. But JL Audio makes great subwoofers and they make great subwoofers for home as well. They're just, they're pricey, but they sound great. They really are good. But I just don't see them, at least in the near future, as becoming a real competitor for making home loudspeakers, full range loudspeakers. And what's the incentive too? I mean, I, I, this is what I was going to ask you too. There's like this level of saturation. And when I was looking yeah. to do speakers in my room, which I'm going to get into with you and in just here in a minute, cause I, I know how much, how much time do you have left just so I can manage expectations here? Uh, you know, another 10 or, I mean, is there a good stream going? I don't even know how many people. Yeah, I, I, let me, let me take a look. Cause I've honestly, but just I don't want to be boring people. Attention. Yeah. And I, I know like that, that it's the tricky part of this. Um, answering the questions yeah let me go through here because there is there is a quite a bit i don't know how many are actually questions versus i can't even go all the way up here all right um there are it looks like there are one two three four five five uh, super chats which is is good because sometimes we get insane amount where you're sitting here for three days um, <laughs> but there, there seems to be a lot of questions to go through. So I will, yeah, if you want to go here. through a couple of those, if, if any, okay. if any of them have pertain to audio, I'd be happy to try to help out with that. Okay. I'd say maybe um, another 10 or 15 minutes is good. Okay. Yeah. Let's start hitting some of the questions. Let's start with the, the, the ones that people, you know, paid for. Thank you everybody. Obviously, um, one guy had tail said, Come on, guys, show some support. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, he's like, what are your thoughts on the Tesla audio systems? Uh, keep up the great content. Uh, Gene, have you heard any of them? My brother has the Model Y. He swears it's a great audio system. Um, I have not sat and listened to it, so I can't intelligently comment. But I do know they put a lot of effort into their audio system. I know it's proprietary. Uh, they, it's not a Harman system as far as I know. It's Tesla's own. And yeah, I can't really give you any comments on it. Um, I've only heard three of them. Uh, and I know that they just announced and I'm not sure I don't don't quote me on this, but I think they just said they're cutting costs on the model three audio system. They're actually mm. cutting taking money out of it. I don't know what that means. If I even heard it right, it might be model Y, but one of the two and it'll probably happen to both of them to save money. Um, the, the three cars that I heard had a problem with reflections reflectivity. When you have a glass roof, yeah. there's only so much you can do to control those reflections. I don't care what you do. And that that's the problem. Even on phone calls, there is you hear the decay time of even talking is like it's scattering all over. And I think that was my big problem with the audio systems is I think that they're well engineered for what they are. But to my to my ear, um, they they just have a problem with the interior space. That That's just it. It's too, too, ref, too much reflections, too many hard surfaces. It's a very reflective cabin and that's that's what i would leave it at brandon now the, the model I, s i have not driven so i i don't know about the model s interior and, and that brings me back one question to you is i'm not a big fan of the trend in the industry where you have these giant glass roofs now like right. why do i have to have that in every car and in, i live in florida and you even with the little shield that comes on you still get blasted with the sun you still feel the it's, heat it doesn't isolate you as well uh, it's a, a massive wow factor, right? Like the lucid air that we did, um, the Sapphire did not have, it wasn't even a, uh, an option as a glass roof, but the regular car that we drove, I, I was filming it. I was like laying down in the back seat with a camera trying to show the scope of this piece of glass. And I, I'm like, this sucks. It's not that it doesn't look cool. I mean, the visibility, the openness that you get is the same openness you walk into a house with like a 20 foot ceiling, right? It's the same yeah. concept. People don't want to feel suffocated in the car and it gives this roominess. But of course, if you like audio 
or trying to have a, a quieter cabin from an engineering point, it's a, what a nightmare. So you lean on all the noise cancellation to quiet it down, playing shit through the speakers to try to get rid of some of that noise. And then you're trying to have yeah. to over insulate other parts. It's a nightmare. It looks cool, but that's about it. Um, and I could go on more, but I won't. Um, Raider Blue, you mentioned Ford's upgraded audio systems are sometimes worse than the base audio system. Can you explain that? Seems counterintuitive. Uh, so the the two recently um, that we that we did, um, one was I'm pretty sure it was an F one fifty, and the I want to say the Bronco Sport. One of the two that had uh, I'd have to go back because we've tested so many cars, but the two the F one fifty that had the upgraded. Bang and Olufsen, the B and O play, and I think it was like a two thousand dollar option. Um, the amount of money they spent on the speakers was roughly the same that they did on the base audio system, and the calibration of however they did the EQing in the car was horrible. Uh, hmm. Like transition from the sub was all messed up. Like you'd you'd have this massive bass swing and like a a thirty dB drop on the crossover, so you have high bass and then you lose all the mid range and then it's like this. The the frequency response is like all over the place and it just sounds it sounds horrible. Like it does. Just forget the graphs for a minute. Yeah. It just sounds like a tin can in there. Everything's thin. It's all bass. You can't dial it out. There's no way to dial it out. Um, it was something that was thrown in there for the, the least amount of money possible. And whoever had to try to fix it in terms of tuning just couldn't do it. There was no way to do it. And some of those systems, and I think we've called them out, we've call, definitely called them out in the videos uh, about that. You know, don't spend the money on it. It's really a waste. You're not getting anything other than having the B&O name on it. Um, and they're one of the few brands and Chevy's done that before too, but Ford definitely is egregious since at that point. And I know they're trying to fix it. I know internally they're trying to fix it, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And I heard um, the systems in the Honda Accord and the Honda, um, the CRV, and they're really bad in my opinion. I don't know if you listen yeah. to them. They got worse. Yeah. Honda used to have decent audio systems back in the day. I don't know why they cut so much. Well, we know they cut budget out of it, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think they were Alpine, the upper end were Alpine, but they weren't brand new yes. Alpine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they were decent, and it's changed a lot. Like, yeah, it, whenever you test, I think the, the new Bose systems, now they're moving over to Bose, of course, Har uh, Bose and then Harman stuff on the Acura side, but the Bose stuff surprisingly has gotten better. So, mm -hmm. like, if you listen to the new Accord and the new Civic, and the Pilot is average because it's such a big cabin on the inside, it's such a big space they have improved over the previous generation. So they're, but again, that's trying to compete with the other brands, what they're doing. And then, you know, as you consolidate down your basically the same engineers working on the cars. So everything's going to sound the same. Um, Bose, get, Bose gets a bad reputation in home audio uh, because that's really, that's not their bread and butter. Their bread and butter is, you know, the headphones and the car audio. And I've heard some really good Bose systems in cars. I, my friend had a C7 Corvette. I thought that system sounded pretty darn good for what it was. Yeah. Surprisingly, GM does a good job in the Corvette. Jack has uh, my my uh, coworker. He's got a C8. Um, and the audio system is, is good for what it is, given the constraints they have in the car. So th yeah. there's ways to do it. They just have to make it a priority, obviously. Um, Mike said, I haven't been able to catch one of these live streams in a while. Keep up the great work. Um, thanks, Mike. And we're doing another live stream, just Jack and I next week. So get ready for a four hour power session. <laughs> you take bathroom uh, so breaks when you go for four hours. I can, I, I can do. never laugh. Yeah, I, I, I do. Cause say. I'm like 90 years old. Jack doesn't have, you know, his prostate's not 50 pounds yet. <laughs> That's me uh, right there. With yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, uh, you reach you reach the 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 uh high powered age of 40 and 50 it starts to become an issue yes um we have uh steven more savage geese forever thank you appreciate it thanks for thanks for coming on uh the biff just thanks for the conversation thank you so much for just coming on and listen to us ramble about stuff um thanks for your focus on quality and honestly uh I should probably be studying right now. Uh, thank you. And the satire. We're very sarcastic, Gene, to a fault. Uh, I have to dial it back for my own self-preservation. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, next one, uh, Matthew. Thanks, Gene, for coming on. Would love another one of the, these. Favorite source for good quality audio now, CD, digital, HD tracks, other. So I'm going to say yes on that. 
I like all good sources of audio. I, I still spin records. People will make fun of it. There's certain music like 70s, 80s fusion jazz that just tra did not transfer as well digitally as it is on analog. So I like to just spin a record sometimes. I listen to Apple Music, Lossless, Tidal, uh, Amazon HD. I still love SACD. I know I'm an, I'm a dinosaur, but I probably have two or 300 SACDs. And, and sometimes I just want to sit in my theater room and put on an SACD, Patricia Barber, or even some of the Genesis uh, re-releases. And I love listening to that. I have some DVD audio. I love the fact that there's Blu-rays now, like one of my favorite artists, Stephen Wilson has, I introduced him to Dolby Atmos. He didn't even know what Dolby Atmos was when he came out with his album in 2011. Now he's mixing all of his stuff in Atmos and you could buy it on Blu-ray. And I love that because there's artwork supporting with the music. So that's a great experience. If you could get music in Blu-ray format, that's my favorite. I have to say that's my favorite. What, uh, just to piggyback off this, um, what service do you use to listen to your music streaming service or what, what's your most common way to play back music if you're listening to it? So I have Tidal and Apple Music and I favor Apple because I think they did a better job implementing spatial audio. I think there's too much level difference in title still going from like you'll you'll be on an Atmos track and then it'll go to two channel and the and the level will jump up 15 dB and scare the shit out of you. I think Apple's a little bit more put together when it comes to that. And Apple has a better selection of spatial audio, but they're both good formats, streaming okay. formats. Uh, do you have like two or three top tracks that you listen to like every single set of speakers that you do, like your favorite three tracks to toss something on that somebody would so, want to like listen to? So there's this, there's this artist called Marion Hill and there's a song called differently and that'll determine if your speakers have good bass or not. And it's just good dynamics, good transients. Uh, Dominic Fee Ame, she's a friend of our channel. She's a Canadian singer, a French Canadian singer, the track called birds. It's just beautiful sound for two channel. Um, you get to hear the clarity of her vocals. You get to hear uh, just decorrelated information. So you can see if you set up a nice wide sound stage. Those are kind of two tracks I listen to a lot. Um, I don't know. I just kind of vary. I'm a jazz person. So I'll put on some Pat Metheny um, when he's in like a three or four piece band because I just want to know the purity of of how his guitar sounds right. and, you know, stuff like that. Some Some of the stuff I listen to is a little obscure that most people probably wouldn't like, but my my music tastes vary yeah it makes sense especially doing what you're doing and you, you're like you're testing speakers like you have to have a wide variety of content to go through i mean i'll throw on drake I, i'll tell you what throw on drake fair trade that song has infrasonic bass if you have a good subwoofer that i didn't even know existed in my car when i listen to it in the car you don't hear it when i listen to it in my home theater i'm like holy cow there's a lot of low end bass in that song i just didn't know that existed and it's actually mixed pretty well like below 30 or below 20 definitely i would i didn't measure it but i'm saying i probably say below 20 there's some stuff going oh, wow. on in that track yeah okay interesting yeah yeah that's cool because everybody always asks that i know i'm sure you i could look it up on your website but that's too much work you know so i'll just <laughs> have you tell people here um, london grammar london grammar is another one london grammar is okay. incredibly well uh produced music and it's good demo material Makes sense. Uh, Bob Wilson asked if Macintosh equals VW, Conrad, Johnson, Volvo, Cambridge equals Chevrolet, B&O, BMW, which audio brand is Stellantis? Dumb question, I know. Man, that uh, seems like math is involved in this one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I I know what you're getting at. I'm, I'm trying to think. Stellantis definitely would be probably something. Gene, what would be the most commodity speaker that is very very bass heavy and very very elevated in the highs let me think about that for a minute like basically just have, just like a v curve just a lot of bass yeah. and a lot of treble hmm. yeah uh it you know there are brands that do that 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 don't follow that philosophy through their entire line. There's, there was a paradigm speaker a few years back. Um, they don't make it anymore, but it was a V curve. It was all bass and treble, but then you get their premier series now and it's a completely neutral speaker. So Klipsch is probably the biggest example of the V curve. Most of their products are just boom and sizzle. 
there's a diff there are a few exceptions there's some good products that they make but a lot of their products are just lots of base high sensitivity we were uh, yeah back in 2010 we did a blind listening test and we even had the clips representative come out to see if he could pick his favorite speaker and he knew every time the clips came on even though we level matched it he picked yeah. it every time he knew it yeah, so, i mean so, you can't yeah, connected. yeah it, it was so obvious how colored the sound was in that speaker and of course he was going to pick that as his preferred speaker because he sold it but i couldn't right. fool him with the blind test because he was already familiar with the sound of the speaker that's unbelievable i mean it makes sense i guess if you spend your life listening to one product like or spending a majority of your like right now you, you'd probably be able to pick it out too I, i'd be curious to see yes. if you tuned a room if you could tune like five rooms and you had like a preset set to compared to your the other people you work with if you could tell your sound signature over the other people that set up rooms like if you did you know room to room yeah. you could pick up yeah. on it. there's no doubt i mean um we all we all calibrate the taste at the end of the day i mean you want to get flat you want to remove the resonances in the room you want to have your base linear but you still have subjective listening preferences look i set my room curve where my base at 20 hertz is you know 5 db above where it is at 100 hertz there's people i have reviewers that like it 10 db or 15 db higher so sometimes people come in my room they're like wow your bass is amazing and then other times like i need more bass and I'll, I notice a lot of people that think that they need more bass are the ones that are really into car audio that have the dual 18s in the back of the trunk right. and they're already probably have hearing damage because they're listening at 120 db eight hours a day while they're driving so it really depends on your hearing acuity you know your listening preference but yeah i absolutely say that everybody tunes their systems differently and if we did that if i had different reviewers come in and tune my system you would you would hear a difference for sure we all have you know various preferences yeah, I watched one of your recent, uh, your, I don't know if it's not technical live. Yeah, I guess it would have been a live stream. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know all the, the remember all the names of the people you have, but I know uh, Anthony Grimani was on there, which I went mm -hmm. back and watched a lot of his like seminar stuff on room acoustics and room treatments. But it was interesting to see like the, the difference in the mentality of the people that you had on like, the one guy was like, I just want bass, right? Like, I don't, I, it, getting rid of it is not negotiable. I need bass. I need a bass curve. And, you know, then there was the more conservative approach. Well, you know, it needs to be a little bit, you know, more level than that. And everybody has a different taste and it's much like cars too, right? Like some people just want it loud and brash, like the Hellcat <laughs> stuff. I mean, there can be a lot that can be done with a car that is obnoxious and fun and loud. And same thing with a system that is just like just turn your guts inside out with bass um, for certain certain uh, music, especially. It can be a lot of fun. So I don't think there's one straight answer. That's one thing I've learned from watching you guys. There's not like one right answer on how to do it. It's no. it's more about what do you like personally and what can you actually do realistically and be happy with. Um, and that's what you've really helped me with figure out in my own home stuff. Yeah. And, and, you know, and even at the end of the day, when you set up your system, there's nothing wrong with using tone controls or, or to have various profiles. So depending on what you're listening to, you might want to adjust the bass or the treble up or down. Um, I have a, I have a mode for my wife. She does not like bass, unfortunately. Okay. And it, and it sucks because if I want to play some deep stuff when she's sleeping, no matter how much sound isolation I did in my room, nothing stopping a 21 inch subwoofer from penetrating the walls. It just doesn't happen. So I have um, a calibration setting for her that knocks the bass 6 dB down and I get rid of the infrasonics because she can't handle the infrasonics. So it's not, nothing wrong with having multiple calibration settings. Yeah, that's smart, especially for that. This is the, looks like the last question we got. Uh, Marantz mm -hmm. MM 7025 power amp versus Parasound A23 plus. So those multi-channel uh, Marantz amps, they're decent. They're by, they're maybe a slight step up from what's in their AVRs. Parasound amp is an exceptional amp. I mean, that's I would choose the Parasound if my, if the money wasn't, you know, a factor. Makes sense. I'm sure you get these questions like this versus that, and sometimes they're not very straightforward, but sometimes they're very straightforward i mean if you're if you're bass managing your speakers and you're not playing it loud you might not even hear a difference between the two amps so it really depends on your listening but if you're doing full range and you have low impedance speakers the parasound's going to drive those speakers with more authority makes sense um i'm just gonna cut off so no more uh because we got to get gene off here he's not the four hour power guy 
Um, uh, I <laughs> have a dinner giant... at some point. <laughs> yeah, I don't want this guy to starve here. I have a giant head and big ears. Hard to find over the ears that are big enough to be comfortable. Use Sennheiser 598s for ears. Recommendations. How do you feel about headphones? I have so many headphones sitting under my desk that I haven't even opened to test yet. Um, I look at the clamping force on headphones because I have the same problem. I can't wear headphones for too long, especially with glasses. And if they put too much pressure on my head, they drive me nuts. I don't know if he's looked at, I like the Focal Stellias. I think they're pretty comfortable. They're, they're a bit bulky, but you know, I think Focal makes a comfortable headphone. If you want a wireless headphone, the Mark Levinson's are actually pretty comfortable. Um, I'm not too thrilled with the call quality on them because it cancels the noise canceling when you're doing a call, which is weird. You hear the cabin when, when you're on an airplane. I don't know why they did that. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that would be my recommendation. We'll always look at the clamping force. If you see a headphone that has a really strong clamping force, if they even specify it, that could be problematic if, if you're wearing glasses or you have a big head and it just pushes down on you. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense too. Uh, and obviously every, again, it's like every head and ear size is different and yeah. what, what you can tolerate. I have like a really narrow ear canal on my right. And so like uh, in-ear stuff, I can't stand it. Like it just doesn't even sound right. So it's weird um, how everybody's, uh, that the same product's not going to work for everybody. Sennheisers have historically been very comfortable in my experience. I had this HD 650s or the 600s. I forgot which one it was. That was a very comfortable open back headphone. Yeah, Sennheiser's like typically if you're like, hey, I need a headphone, you can pretty much recommend most of their. Are they are they actually Sennheiser anymore? Like now that they sold off that division, is it still the same engineers? Do you know that are doing headphones, or is it different now? I don't know the intricacies of that. I don't really follow that too much. So yeah, I didn't. I'm assuming they still are operating under that brand. I don't, I don't know if the engineers are still there or not. So yeah, I can't tell you. Okay. Well, I'm going to get Gene off here. There's probably about 100 more questions I could ask you. Uh, we'll have to do this as a part two at some point. Um, and I think people get more used to this, and we'll, we'll come up with a plan of what we want to tackle in terms of topics. And I'll go through the comments as well and see what people are kind of like digging into and asking. But I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today and like kind of going over the background and history in a way I think we can get more geeky next time. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Gene, for coming on here. Thanks for having me. I was awesome to be introduced to your audience. I, you know, would welcome future collabs for sure. Yeah, there's so much to learn and you're you're a wealth of knowledge like beyond this. We're I literally we're probably scra scraping the the less than a, a fine piece of dust on a table of like what we can talk about with you. So, I appreciate it again. Enjoy your dinner and uh thank you again for coming on here. All right, can I say until next time, keep listening. Now I can now I can kick you off here. This guy's a bomb. <laughs> he, he he doesn't measure things the way I measure them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Gene. Talk to you Thank soon. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, guys. So, guys, uh, I am going to uh, take just a, like a small break. Uh, cause I know there's a couple questions I want to go through. I just don't want to cancel you off. I have another 30 minutes. So I'm going to talk to Gene here for a second and I will be right back.
All right. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. You can let me know. I'm back. Sorry about that delay. I'm going to go through some of these last couple uh, questions. Um, so yeah, if uh, I appreciate everybody coming on here. I know this is a little bit different. We're going to be doing a live stream um, next week, Jack and I. Uh, so I think the, the, the main thing is we're going to try to do two of these a month uh, between Jack and I. Obviously, if it's just Jack and I, it's going to get extremely tiring because we're only so interesting for so long um, and I don't want to just keep rehashing the same thing over and over so we got to keep it pretty uh, pretty interesting but the good thing is um, with some of this is we're going to start bringing people on more and more in terms of uh, different uh, different engineers from different brands that, that's the goal we're going to be talking about different cars in in really great detail with the people that have created them um, because what we're finding is in some of these videos that we're doing, it's getting way more complicated to try to interview people out. Like we're trying to interview people about these cars and their history, and it's making the videos uh, very difficult to make. And you're losing so much because you got to pick and choose what goes in the videos and what doesn't. Uh, so if I have a history, like this guy tells me about how he did all this stuff and it's like 30 minutes long. I, you know, it's really hard to justify that putting it in a video about a car, but there might be some amazing story. So we're going to try to bring some people on so they understand how some of this works. Um, and then uh, try try to, you know, share some of that detail to supplement the video projects that we're doing. Um, and, you know, like having a guy like Gene on, um, you know, we're, I want to have him on and, and people that he works with so we get some of the back end uh, details. about uh, the back end details about how things work. And he he's, you know, essentially an industry expert in terms of um, he, he's an industry expert in terms of how things work and why they work the way they they do. And uh, I, I take a lot of uh, how do I put this? I think it's super important to have people that have this much experience that can share that level of detail because uh, guys like him, um, they're not so straightforward. Like if you work behind a company and this, this happens a lot where we meet media that have been working in the media or like for big magazines for a long time. And they're not very forthcoming about, uh, certain things because it's hard for them to be, if you work for a big company to, to be honest with viewers. And I think the guys like Gene, he can really bring a wealth of knowledge and, um, other people in the industry that want to be a part of it. We want to share other people's stories so that to me, that's fun. And I think Gene understands that as well. So we're going to get him back. Uh, and, and some of his crew, he made me aware that somebody that he works with is really close to us, like proximity wise. Um, and there's some opportunity there to kind of learn more and talk about this stuff and share that information. So, uh, that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, I'm going to go through, uh, and if there's people, if you're still watching this, obviously I know there's people still on here. If there's others that you'd like to hear from or stories that you'd like to hear th from, please put it in the comments so I can go through and have a better idea of who you want to see um, and who you like topics you'd want to you you want to talk about or hear talked about on the back end uh, most more so from you know brands and people that are designing cars uh, as well um, I know that uh, there's some questions in here about you know I, I talked about NSX a couple times and it, the the goal is is if it, everything is approved that will be out by the end of um, January I've been working on it every single day uh, for the past month or so like the editing part and uh, I will be kind of you'll see some updates about a week before it comes out like on social media like things you know pictures or whatever so you're you're gonna see that coming out as well too uh, in terms of uh, what to expect. Um, I'm going to go, since we're still, I'm going to cut this off in about 10 minutes. So if there's any more questions, throw them at me uh, before I, I disconnect. I, I'm going to go through a couple uh, pictures of, since we're talking about audio stuff, uh, and I didn't want to bore Gene with this because he, you know, he deals with this all the time. Um, but but kind of my background story with um, how I got back into home theater and how I connect it back to the car stuff. Uh, I, 
I always loved music and I had a really good ear um, and I loved movies, obviously. So I, I just grew up like, I, I remember sitting there when I set up my dad's stuff when I was like 10 years old and I would literally unplug every speaker and just listen to the sub. I would watch a movie and just listen to the whole movie through the subwoofer, nothing else. And then I would go back and play the same movie because you're a kid, right? What else? What the hell else am I going to do in the summer? So I'd plug in one surround sound speaker, like it was ProLogic, but I was interested in like how it separated out. So I had this really good ear for the way that the movies were mixed and I would listen to each speaker at a time. And that's kind of how I got really into it. And then the same thing with music. I, I remember I loved, my dad listened to, oh geez, like Linda Ronstadt. I was just talking about her today. And uh yeah, you know, um, Johnny Mathis and some of, you know, just uh, Steve Winwood, you know, I'd, I'd get woken up at seven in the morning. My dad was like blasting this music. So I clearly I, I heard a lot of that. But then I got into I got into like obscure music. Um, I was really big into like hardcore metal early on. And then I loved like electronic and just diverse like most people. But I remember listening to the old um uh, Master of Puppets album and like Kill 'Em All back in the day, the Metallica stuff. And I would literally listen to the sub track from the receiver just to hear the double bass on like how it, how it sounded because I wanted to play guitar and drums at that time. And that's how I would learn listening to music was just unplugging speakers. It, it's just silliness. And I, of course, I don't do that anymore because uh, I don't have the time uh, to do that. But um, that's that's what kind of got me into home theater and all that is just going to that level and I was really excited to get back into it when I had a real job and I had some disposable income and not disposable I'm talking like I could spend like 1500 on a receiver or like a thousand on speakers you know not like crazy money but I had an apartment that was is it was in the basement and it was just a it had a suspended ceiling it was a really really perfect room size well isolated out it didn't need a lot of room treatments and even back then you couldn't really measure stuff like you could now you needed to get to a professional but i started playing around with that i did projectors in there and i did a painted screen back when people were painting screens on the wall versus buying screens so i was really excited to get into it and then um i'm going to share my screen here uh, because you know that's what this is about we're about sharing um so let's go and see what we got here I'll just do my entire screen because that's oh somebody doesn't know how to present what a loser I think I'd be on enough conference calls now to to share a screen properly okay so let's get this out of here we're not seeing a mirror um let's see if I can find my original room okay so when I moved into a house like I, it was really hard to find a place in this area I think it was like 2009 and this, this, like, I wound up getting a house because this is the best we can find, and there was no room in the house to do an audio setup or home theater. So I had all this stuff from the apartment, and this wound up being my media room. And obviously, if you don't know anything about TV or media and all this stuff, it's like the worst case scenario. And this is where I had my projector because I had it in, you know, my old apartment. So I had this old Panasonic projector, which was really great for the era. And I had this old, you know, this Karata screen that I finally bought instead of doing a painted on screen. Um, and I had the, it in this room. And it was like, it really killed audio and home theater for me after that. Like I, I this was 2009 and this is how I found Gene's stuff because I was doing a lot of research back then. And then I would say living in this house, I didn't go back to to Audioholics and all that for a good seven years because I just never had the space for it. Um, and then hopefully I don't have any nudes of myself in here. And then I went into a new place and I'm going to kind of, so this was the room in the new house that I was in. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a media room. It's more of a rectangular room. Uh, there's carpet, there's four walls and a ceiling and one window. Let's see what I can do. Um, cause this was the family room in this new house, of course, another giant space that just sounds like an echo chamber. So I wound up just doing this room. Um, I didn't spend a lot of money on gear. I'd got Emotiva speakers at the time. I think they were like $800 or $700. And to be fair, they tested really well for the room that I was in. Um, and you know, the things that I did do, I screwed around with making my own room treatments. So this is like really simple, right? Like it's really what I cared about was having the two, two, um, front speakers and then my center. I could never find a place to put a center cause I didn't want to put the TV on the wall and it's just room problems. 
since I got this all done, I really just really enjoyed listening to music in there. Um, and then I got into doing some messing around with room treatments. So I got a four inch acoustic foam on and making my own and moving, cause you can move them around really easily. And I could figure out, okay, if I move it here, what happens to the sound in measuring it? And that's when I started to get really into it. Um, but the room was always, you know, honestly, the room was always gonna be the limiting factor with it. So there wasn't so much I could do and I got it to the place where I really enjoyed it. And this was kind of the final place where I was like, I gave up on it. I was so busy with the video stuff and cars that, Okay, if I wanted to watch a movie, I could, and it you know, was better than what I had before. I didn't even set up, set up my surrounds in this room because it just it just didn't sound right, and I had the couch against the wall, um, so it it was it is what it was. Um, and now, with my dad's stuff, the funny part is this is what I remember as a kid. This is what I was always stuck with. He's like, oh, can you go? I want to get something new. Can you set this up? And I'd find this pile of wires. And I look at these wires and I just like, I want to die because it, it just everything with my dad's stuff always wound up being cables and wires. That's like an ongoing joke. And um, I learned so much from like tearing stuff down and putting it back together um, that it's just, it's a, it's a drudgery like for anybody, but I really enjoyed the, the process of setting it up. And then I just recently redid my dad's room. His uh, LG OLED broke for like the third time. So this was like his temporary setup. So I kind of redid his room. Um, and it, shockingly, it's got all this horrible like wood paneling, but it's almost like a diffusion. Uh, in this room, despite it being really weird, sounds so good in there. And, you know, it didn't take much to calibrate it out where it's so enjoyable for movies. The music is it's a little bit different, but I mean, it's got a hodgepodge of equipment. He's got a Yamaha receiver and like, look at all these, you can see this down here is his CD players that every time I move them, all the CDs fall out inside and I have to take the whole case off because it's a carousel. So, you know, I just set this up recently and I enjoy doing that, which I have to finish. Um, and then I finally did my own room um, in my new place. And again, uh, I had a projector, which I just gave up on. So I used my old screen, my Corrado, which they don't make anymore. And I did a short throw projector, which it's fine. The focus is not great in the corners, but it, it's good for at nighttime and you want to watch TV. It's, you know, bookshelf speakers. Um, and then I finally decided I was going to set up my, my new room, my new media room. And this is where I kind of like reconnected with Audioholics and like getting into audio again. Um, and I decided I was going to do this room, but the story was, uh, this is kind of where it is before I finished it. I always wanted a set of sulk uh sulk front speakers and uh in 2009 of course he started making these and they have the song towers and he he basically wanted to make speakers himself and do all the cabinetry so it was all handmade it took him like two months to make one set of speakers so they're like really really special physically and so when i was ready to buy them last year i go onto his website and uh let's see if i can find this If I could type, yeah, I'll just type it in wrong. Notice, as of September 25th, we're no longer accepting orders for speakers. We sold our woodworking equipment and no longer have a shop. So I waited too long, like a fool, and uh, he didn't make them. So I'm like, I started looking at digging around, and for sure he was done, he was retiring, but he had one set of speakers left. And he found him under the stairs, and this was all he had left of his business after 20 years. And I messaged him, I'm like, dude, they, they were used. Um, I, I didn't make them how I wanted them. That's what you did with those. I'm like, I just wanted to complete that circle of uh, getting these. So I drove all the way to Michigan to get the last set from him. And this was Jim. I'd never talked, I'd never met this guy before. I really knew nothing about him. So I talked to him for like an hour, him and his wife, about how he ran the speaker business and how difficult it was to do this in this space that everybody wanted everything for nothing. Big shock. And there was no real market to keep a custom speaker making the woodworking to that level anymore. And he just wanted to be happy and retire and spend time with his wife. So I got his last set of speakers. He refinished them and refurbished them. Um, so I was super excited and I got them for like next to nothing compared to what they were before. So once I got them set up, I started to redo my room um, and doing the measurements and the measurements are decent. I And the room, like everything, uh, Gene was saying this, the room, if you're going to do an audio system, the room is everything. You can spend maximum amount of money and gear 
but if your room is horrible, it's gonna sound like crap. So I really, I went and spent more time setting up the room and I still don't have it right. So now, you know, this is kind of where it's at. I have a diffuser, half diffusers, absorbers, circular or, you know, uh, curved absorbers. Um, and then I have 3D diffusers. And a lot of this is audioholics, right? Like all the people that do room design, it's, it's basing it on some of their information. I did two subs in here. Um, to try to minimize the room. And as you can see, the room's got a high ceiling, so it's not perfect. And I think what this what this taught me is doing this is I love music and the room, it sounds great in there, as good as it's gonna sound without spending more money on more treatments. Um, the whole thing is, for me, you can do all this stuff um, and it, a lot of it is where do you stop? And, and I learned this too from the car thing. Like, I've always wanted, I want this car, that car, I'm going to change this. And then I wound up just dicking around too much. And I set myself a goal. And like, I got the speakers I wanted, even though they're probably not the best speakers anymore. I could get a better speaker. There's no doubt about it. I could get a better amp. I could get a better receiver. I could get a better TV. But at the po there's a point of which, where are you happy with it? And I feel like I got it to a place with the help of, you know, like their website of setting it up, learning how to calibrate it, going through that process. And I could have done it probably even my old speakers would have been just good enough. Um, and you can do it for a lot less money now. You can get a real setup, really good sound out of uh, like any room with far less money than you could and really enjoy music and movies if you have the time. And to me, when I get done like with this or editing or, you know, filming these cars with Jack, it's about the only thing I have to decompress is to like sit there and try to listen to music, even that small amount of time or watching a movie and watching some real artist like people that are, are just unbelievably talented put something together and see how it's all crafted. It's like one of the, the few joys that I get. So doing that room um, is so important to me. Same thing with like the car thing, you know, getting out and driving a car. And I, I'm sure most of you feel the same way. Um, there's something special about just getting out and going for a drive or feeling that connection to the car. It, it, it's like a, a sense of uh, relief or release that you get from that experience. Uh, and that's something that uh, the the home theater stuff, which is why I have this stream about it, and the car stuff are so similar. They're, they're ways and outlets to get away from um, your normal, your routine, the hamster wheel that you get on with life, with work and projects and whatever else you have going on. It's a, it's a special thing. So that's why I wanted to share that part of it. Um, and that's why the audio in cars is also important to me because as cars become more of uh appliances like they're they're so so much so dumbed down now and like dead inside and in some ways it's great as a commuter because you, you it's quiet it's comfortable it's like a peaceful space but there's not a lot of life to it so if there's not a lot of life in a car to drive at least i can sit back and listen to music or at least hopefully enjoy the the audio experience of, of driving and trying to find some joy in it so that's why i look at the audio stuff in cars a little bit differently too um, not just like what's better, you know, how much, you know, how much is the best system. It's not about that. It's about the enjoyment part, the, the, the whole enjoyment part of a car. Um, so I, I know there's a couple questions. Uh, I will get to those and I'll go through some more of these questions. Um, I bought my 2020 uh, Mazda 3 six speed manual. Part of your review CDs ripped to flack. Sounds great. I think you guys I think of you guys when I drive it like a monkey on farm roads. <laughs> yeah, the, the again, it's like, it's that part of the driving connection to a car. It's just that that personal space. Um, it, it's an interesting psychological thing. It's it's uh, it, it, depending on where you're driving, of course. If you're stuck in traffic and you just want a road rage, it's different. But it's your own personal space. There's something special about that car if you can connect with a car. Um, Check out Earl Geddes. He worked on NVH for Ford. He sells his own speakers and pioneered home theater design concept the average guy can implement. Yeah, that again, it's people like that that are doing this work to make things more accessible and, and you know, get people interested in new things and new avenues. Um, because that's part of what's fun, right? When you experience something you never experienced before, it opens up a whole new world to you. And I think we're... As much as we have all this this knowledge and ways to experience new things, thanks to the internet and all social media and all that, um, 
I think most people on here would agree, or probably if you've been in that point in your life, the, one of the most memorable things you've ever done, either a vacation or a car, is the first time you experienced any. You were totally your expectations, you had no expectations, or you had a ton, and you were totally blown away by it, and it sticks in your brain as like, wow, that was cool. Um, and some of that was, that's why I'm kind of like talking about the audio stuff too, is that when you listen to music for the first time, uh, and, and you didn't you didn't even like music, but if you, you listen to it for the first time on something that somebody put a lot of effort into doing, like sound engineering or like a home theater setup, you're like, wow, that is so cool. I would like to listen to all my music, and then you go down the rabbit hole of it. Um, love your channel, Mark. Thank you. Please continue to bring much joy to me and so many others. Just got my an RS3, partly due to your review. Uh, that RS3, I you know, it's one of those weird cars after we did the video on it that I was just kind of um, like, oh, you know, cool car. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be, but I seriously have gone back over the past year since I did that video and thought about that car more than I care to admit. I've like looked at it to see how much it costs and I would not buy one, but it is that cool that I would consider owning one if the price was right because the engine experience was just so, so unique. I'm uh, not a lot like it um, in the industry. It's so such a special uh driving car uh mark jack love it i would be uh would it be possible for you guys to do a midlife crisis video on what top five cars you would consider without spending a shitload of money a c6 z06 s2000 996 911 what would you pick for a third vehicle um that that's a really good question honestly uh and all, all these questions are, have have meat to them as well it's just the midlife crisis car is really difficult in terms of how much money you have because the, there's always something loaded with it the the older ones you get um you know like s2000 if you get an s2000 now you can't get long blocks anymore it's getting harder to get parts and granted the car's reliable i can speak to that specifically it's pretty reliable but you know as parts become more scarce um your enjoyment factor of having a car that you can't get parts for or you have to worry about if you break it you can't drive it a hundred percent if you want it to like you could like a new car that you know you have parts or you can get warranty done on it so it's tricky even with some of these older cars that you may enjoy you may have them as a third car but there's going to be some work that you're going to have to put into them and you're going to have to do your research and that's something i found more so again Sorry, I keep bringing it up because I'm working on it. That, that NSX video, like I would love to own that car. And I could make you probably a binder full of things that you would have to do to it or prepare to do to it or potentially buy in advance to keep as a spare part. Um, not to say that it's going to break, but there's all these things that you're going to have to do for long-term ownership. And the same thing with a Porsche, this, these things that you have to think about. So... Um, Jack and I will get together. I think that's a really smart idea to talk. Maybe just do a video about like the cars and then the fine print of like what you would have to do with them as an, an ownership experience. Um, because they are, there's some affordable, amazing cars out there that are, you know, they're, they, they may not be the fastest thing, but they're really enjoyable. And that's a list right there that's, that's great. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely have to come back to that and give it some more thought. Dude, holy shit, what a story. As a former maker of handcrafted stuff, thank you. Also been a follower of you and Jeans for years. Thanks again, Mr. Biff. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry that story also ran a little long, but I, I wanted to like connect why, um, you know, I don't consider myself an audiophile, but I do really appreciate music and I do know how things work with sound to a good extent enough to know how to try to set it up. Um, I would never get it. It's like, uh, I talk about this a lot with driving. You get to that, uh, 99th percentile, like I've gotten to a lot of things from driving, I've gotten to the top, and then to get into that 1%, to know as much and to be that is competitive and as good as that 1%, you just, most people never get, and I'll, I will never get there in terms of driving. And in terms of the audio stuff, I feel like I'm in the 95th percentile of understanding how things work and how the technical part works. Um, but that's where I'm going to cap out because I, I, I'm not going to go into that industry. So I lean on other people to help. And that, that's, what's awesome about this is getting people to like share that, that knowledge. So yeah, thanks man. Um, Mr. Affa, how can cars with glass panoramic roofs be set up well for audio? And the straight answer is they can't, it's full of compromise. Um, there, there's ways and tricks they do it, uh, with insulation and, uh, isolation and noise canceling that that's it um, if you have an entire glass structure around your head 
there's only so much you can do with speakers uh, in terms of where you place them. Excuse me, I got a cough, and I don't want to cough on the mic. All right, exaggerated cough, but I got it out. Um, yeah, it's just, you're not going to fix it. So you have to decide, like, if you like audio, don't get a car with a glass roof. You know, that that's it. Uh, it doesn't really get much more complicated than that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, I, I think really at this point, um, I'm going to go through some of the questions, obviously, and see if there's anything that's not in the, the, the page chat, because I, I hate when people throw money in and then I'm, like ignore it. Um, uh, Nightwish said, Mark, I love your in-depth and honest reviews. Let me show that. That makes it way easier for people. Uh, great car. For, I have a 23 Elantra on having a blast. Great car for the money. Keep up the good work. Yeah, if, you, if you've ever... If you don't like Hyundai and Kia, or you don't like the Elantra N or the way it looks or whatever, just ignore it for once and try to get out there and drive it. It's one of those cars, uh, you know, we talk about all this audio stuff and speakers, like I'm never going to get my hands on a $20,000 set of speakers and bring them in my room. It's just not possible. But most people can get into an Elantra N, even on a test drive, to experience how cool that car is for the money. Like, it's it's one of those, um, that's just fun. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, uh, Bobby just turned 40 and his midlife crisis mobile is a 22 Mustang GT performance pack. I love it. I know a lot of people agree that there's, that that's hard to match the performance of that car. Namely, if you buy it right, um, it, it's very, very well done given the size of it. It's crazy what they, they got out of that car for just how meaty it is. Uh, can you make a playlist or extra channel just for your cut content you weren't able to use in videos? It doesn't have to be polished or edited. Just upload as supplemental extra content. Yeah, that's it. I think it's going to get there. Honestly, right now what I'm doing is I'm putting extra stuff on Patreon. Um, and it has to go on Patreon because, you know, like right on cue, Dan, um, you know, you got guys like Dan and Mr. Affa, uh, who have been on Patreon supporting, us for a long time um and like dan is a guy who even when things have been tough he's he's been around and it's like that support on the back end of knowing that you don't know how long you can do this not just physically but f to a certain extent financially where you're trying to run it as a business or not um and trying to do the right thing where you don't piss people off and trying to be real um like those are where that's where that extra content's gonna go to be honest if if there is extra content and it's hard because i don't i probably could well i can pop this i don't know if i can sh oh fuck up the camera let's see here since the camera keeps this going you can see on the floor over there so i have all my hard drives like here here i have uh 30 or 40 of those um because it's just cheap storage, I can do like 18 terabytes for 200 bucks versus my old uh, NAS or SAN that was unbelievably expensive for storage. Uh, so I just pile up Western Digital. So I go through these drives like, and I have to pull out old content. It just becomes a real, if I don't do it right away after the video, there's no way I'm gonna get time to go back and release the content. But I think where we're going, I said I was gonna release all the NSX stuff because there's an insane amount and it's really cool. Like it's real cool content, but some of this, the extra content that we get on press trips and all that is not the greatest. Like some of the interviews are literally cut up just to make them watchable. And if I released the supplemental stuff, <laughs> he'd be like, what is this? How did you get anything out of this? Um, so not all of it is great. Um, I think what we don't do a good job of is um, talking about the stuff that we go through in the background, like making a video. Um, it's I don't want to say it's inside baseball, but some of the stuff that really is difficult and we we're t jack and i were talking about this today uh we have this alexis gx press launch to go to and you know you fly there and um you got like you have a day to shoot a car like literally you show up they dump all the information on you the chief engineer from lexus is going to be there for it and um we found out they don't have enough cars for all the journalists they invited, right? They're, they ha they're pairing you up, so you're paired up with somebody else. So luckily, Jack and I can go together, but they want to pair you up with a third person. And if you've ever been on this at these events, it's, it's a nightmare. Like, 
they they sh they get you up at 8:30, slam you with a presentation. You go on this drive route that takes you nowhere. You know where you're going, and then you have to figure out a place to pull over and shoot all this footage, and then talk about all the stuff in like like literally a consolidated one hour period you have to sum up everything you learned try to get an interview in with somebody you've never met before learn all the technical details film a whole video uh drive around in the middle of nowhere for hours and get back and be exhausted on a plane the next day um and then to find out that you have to have somebody else with you so we found out there's going to be a third person with us in a car and i told the the brand rep i'm like how are we supposed to do a good job on your product when i'm gonna to have to bring somebody else along in the car what are they going to do while we're filming? Are they going to be okay with standing outside for three hours in the heat or cold while we're standing there shooting B-roll? And, and they're like, well, we, we, this is all we can do. So the constraints of trying to do a good job, this industry is not set up for it. And I think that's where I get really, really frustrated with trying to do this long term is, you know, you're one piece of the giant you know, cog, right? You're a little small fraction of it. So you're not more important than anybody else, which I totally understand. And I'm not asking for that. But for me to to continue doing it, I, I I can't do it like that. I can't just travel and blow three days of my life to spend, you know, five hours cramming something in just to shit a video out. That to me is the worst case scenario. And I know Jack on the business side, he he's like, dude, we got to do some of this stuff. It's also, if you don't do it, then the brands don't want you a part of their launch program. You don't get access to the engineers. Like we'll never get access to the Lexus GX chief engineer or the Land Cruiser G engineer ever again, ever. Like he'll come here once and that's it. So that's like your window, that 30 minutes to talk to this guy, um, in a big company, it's, it's really hard to do. So, um, long-term, uh, we're trying to figure out creatively how to keep, keep like helping us learn and help people getting engaged and learning about new products, even if they're not interested in learning about the people behind them and how they did what they did. Uh, because the next generation of engineers, uh, if we can show like, okay, they did this today. Somebody's like, oh, I think that's cool. I want to go and make that better and go to school and work for a car company. Like, I'm going to take that. I love that. I'm going to make that better. And we have this evolution. If we can help reach some of those younger people that are, are on the fence about getting into this field because it's so saturated, showing them some of the actual real stuff. That's what I love. But it's it's even hard on our end to do that because it's not... I guess it's not valued as much as we thought it would be. Um, it's just more of getting, like most brands want to do a launch event and send you out with 50 other journalists and have 50 people release a video and articles all at once. That's that's the majority of what they want out of these events. So um, we've been constantly trying to figure out how how we bring value to it and the people that are watching not to waste time while also trying to have a little bit of fun. And you'll see like that trailblazer video we did. I mean, honestly, it's not a good car and I wanted to have fun and some of the, I wanted to have fun finally just being honest about the fact that it wasn't a good car and I could be sarcastic as hell and nobody would care about it. Um, that's that, that gives me great joy. But then you have viewers that are like, why did you do this? You're wasting my time. And it's this double edged sort of, how do I stay happy? How do I keep Jack happy? How do we keep potential new people that are going to work for us happy and engaged and learning? And then also keeping the viewers happy with the fact that, a lot of these cars we're doing are boring as shit. You know, how do we make it interesting? So that's that's the challenge. And that's some of the stuff that we're trying to share on the back end. Um, and that's hard to do. It just, to be honest, and it's going to go to <laughs> longest answer in history. Uh, a lot of that's going to Patreon. So Dan, thank you again. Uh, longstanding help uh, on Patreon side. He enjoyed it, clearly. He's using an old Carver and Yamaha NS1000 as a des as desktop speakers, and that makes sense. I mean, the Yamahas were always pretty good for what that is. I I've used stuff like that, too. I have all my old Yamaha stuff from my first receiver, and then I don't remember them. I think it was an RX2500, and I literally just used it to power two bookshelf speakers because it just sounds good. It, it has no value anymore. You could probably find it on the internet for like an eBay. It would still work for another 20 years for $100 and just get a good set of bookshelves or like what Dan's doing. It'll sound great, better than, you know, any like shitty uh, desktop speaker you get from Amazon or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't want to keep boring people. I mean, I still got people sitting here being abused by my voice. Um, I'm going to go back and see if I can find a couple more questions, and then we uh, we will uh, kill this so you can have a night to yourself and enjoy yourself. Um, yeah.
yeah i'm sorry guys i'm just looking for some some questions here to to throw into the mix some regular questions because i'm tired of talking about me real tired of talking about me Is it remotely possible to interview someone like Andreas Proninger but hide their identity and keep a deeper level of industry insight as a result? I wish leaks moved into video realm at Savage. Um, okay, this is the straight answer to this, right? Um, Jack was going to... Uh, Jack, or actually Andreas was supposed to be at the uh, ST event and we were he was going to interview him. Um these guys are industry guys. They've been in their fields for a long time. And guys like him, uh, there's there's a lot of guys in every brand like Andreas, right? Andreas is like on the back end now. He's he's like the face of the brand for all this stuff. And there's a lot of the engineers behind the scenes that are are doing some of the work. So he's not as hands on as he used to be. Um, but as you get to a certain point in age, right? Like with any job, you're not gonna be doing some of the dirty work. You're gonna be moving into different directions where you're better suited. Um, most of these guys that have spent their entire career to build a career and to retire with a brand are not gonna sell out their brands. They're not even gonna risk being honest by it unless they've been completely scorned. Um, and it's, it, why would you? Honestly, if you were in a career and you had a pension with some brand or you were going to get some kickbacks from like retiring with a brand, you know, the last thing you're going to do is like hang up your, your cleats, head home to your uh, 10 wives and be like, you know, J Mark from uh, Savage Geese, wants me to go blur my face and trash the company and tell you all the inside baseball. This is, they're just not going to do it. I don't think anybody would do it. I think there's stuff to be learned from these guys that they're pretty, the real guys will tell you. They'll tell you about the stuff and it's about putting it, framing it in the right way. And we're going to have people coming on here um, that you frame it the right way, where it doesn't put their job at risk, their career at risk, and they'll be pretty honest about, this is this is why we had to do it this way. This is the result. Maybe not ideal, but like anything, it's about some type of compromise. But I, I think there's still stories to be told without completely defacing what you've done or the, the culture of work. Um, you know, and this is something I didn't get when I was younger. Like, I just, I was so idealistic. Like, we got to do the best job possible. Why aren't we doing it this way? And then you realize that as you move up into the business and the bigger it is, like, there's these, the hierarchy of what's important to a business, right? And after a while, it gets watered down and, and forgotten, like, what's important. And you, you lose the core because you got too many people, too, <clears throat> too many people working, too many managers, and then you just go on this like crash course of everybody's just trying to make more money and do the minimal amount of work possible, and that culture gets watered down after a while. Um, and, you know, that that's just what happens with some of this stuff, and I, I feel like I've been there, and I kind of get, I get why it is the way that it is. Um, but again, it's like anything with life, right? You find the people that you... A, you know, you have a connection with that really kind of connect with your message and you, you try to share that out with people that view the same thing to a certain extent. Um, let's see what else. Um, uh, you want to have product planners on here that we will, that's our, we've already talked about that. We're going to, we're going to have product planners. And I think they're one of the most interesting people that can tell you what's realistic or not. And we met some product planners that are salty as hell. Like, this is what we wanted to do. Um, and they axed 95% of it because there was no money. Or if you're a product planner for a brand outside of your, your home market, like, you know, like most car companies are, if you're a German, uh, an American brand rep for a German car company, there is a huge difference in what the Americans want versus what the Germans want. And it's like this. The Japanese are the same way in a lot of part. They don't work hand in hand. Like what, trying to explain to the Japanese what, you know, the United States or North America wants is like, it's totally different, right, than their home market. So it's it's a lot of push and pull. Um, and you have to have, you got to be really patient with it. Really patient. I, I don't envy that job. That's just, most of the time you're set up to fail. I hope the video doesn't keep cutting out I don't object performance yet, but I'm very confused. Guess what? I'm cutting out the video because my camera just keeps turning off. It's probably overheating. No, probably not. It's actually like freezing in here. Uh, it's technology. Um, I think I'm just going to 
I'm going to end it. Let's see what else we got uh, any, at the end here. Uh, I know everybody is ready to go to bed. Um, there's, there's a few questions at the end I'm just going to randomly pick and click. Brother Goose, you need to get some sun, brah. Get out of the crappy Midwest and come to Santa Barbara. Do I look like I would fit in in California with this face? Maybe Venice Beach, you know, with this body. Yeah, there's no sun here right now. Let, let me show you what our forecast is for this weekend. I'm going to make Jack go outside and film a, an Equinox. Let's see what we got. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. For uh, Monday... Just what you want. You want to see the weather forecast. I know. It's okay. That's what you came on here for. Monday. And yes, that's in Fahrenheit. I'm sorry. The camera won't focus there. Negative 211. So that's what I'm going to send Jack out to do a documentary on the Chevy Equinox. Um, and uh, he's going to freeze to death. So yeah, it sucks right now. This is the worst time of the year. January and February. That's why we got a bunch of piles too. A lot of the cars are going to be the least interesting thing possible because uh, half the fleet, this is a talking point, half of our fleets are pulling cars because they don't want to put, they don't want, they don't have the budget to put winter tires on the car or all seasons. So they're just pulling cars out of the fleets now. Um, and uh, the press fleets, where we get cars from, uh, the fleets are the worst they've ever been in history. Like, well, past 20 year history. They're decimated. The budgets have been slashed across all the brands. Everybody's cutting money from the fleets, uh, and and that that so this year is going to be really interesting. Um, I it's just probably a sign of the car economy. I think you know we talked about this earlier last year about uh, where the the car economy is because you had a, a you didn't have inventory right, so you're seeing these reports that are so ridiculous right now where, oh, look how many cars they're selling compared to last year. Yeah, well, they didn't have inventory. Of course, it looks like they're selling way more because you couldn't get them. Um, but, you know, now you're getting inventory. I think Toyota broke a record for production. So they're they're like ramping up. So now you're going to have the problem of interest rates. Like people don't want to be buying a $50,000 car at 7% interest so or 6% interest so it's tricky like one of these is going to bounce on i think the the brands know that sales are going to be low this year because of that they're not going to be able to move as much uh so i know that the fed is supposed to cut rates twice this year maybe uh again i don't know you know i'm not i'm not an economist but the the rumor mill is like march and december it should be back down by december and the unless something changes so i think that that'll start to 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 kick uh, we'll see the economy change and what's going on with cars. Um, but I think good, the good thing is if inventories come up and the interest rates drop, you won't have this like, okay, people are going to run to the dealerships and buy up inventory. They'll be built up enough where you won't have the price gouging again. At least that's what I'm looking forward to, uh, at least in, you know, the fun car stuff because I'm tired of it. Um, I got to do, we're, we can't get Mini from anybody. Like, like we've asked for Minis forever and they're just, they don't care. Like BMW doesn't care about it. I, I, they make the cars, they don't do media on it. So I would love, I like minis. I think they're fun to drive, but I have I have not seen a mini besides from that EV like experiment. The last one we did, I think was that, that was it. Um, uh, this, it's 8.30, you know, most of us go to bed now by 7.30 PM when you get to my age and I get up at 5 AM for my fiber my fiber aid in my bottle of water. No, I don't. I go to bed really late. I have to because I'm one of those guys. You know, I think I'm really cool staying up till three in the morning. I live out my uh, teenage years at the clubs where people are like, oh, Mark's here, man. Wow. You know, he's here again. No, nobody ever did that. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm just rambling. I'm going to I'm going to cut this off. But you know, again, we're going to be doing a live stream next week, Wednesday, and I will post that up. It's just Jack and I will be doing an ass load of question and answer outside the scope of me rambling. So if you want to come here next Wednesday and you want to be ultra bored, um, we're, we're really going to knock the ball out of the park. So I really appreciate everybody um, coming on here. 
And uh, if you have any final thoughts or questions, please comment now. I will give you, I wish I could set a timer here. I will give you two minutes and I'm going to cut this off if you don't mind. Okay, the timer's been set. I will do speed round. Thanks, Mark. You know, I say that all the time. Thanks, Mark. You're a great guy. Uh, Miata is always the answer. Yes. Wagons. Here, well, oh, sorry. I don't want to cheat you out of this. Keep up the live stream. Miata is always the answer. Clubman JCW is never mentioned. Yeah, I know. Well, it's, I would love to get one. one. Thanks. Have a good night. Keep up the incredible work. Thanks for sticking with it and being genuine. Ah, thank you. Does your family member still have the Prelude? No, that car was ruined. My mom destroyed that car. Thanks, Mom. I could have had an automatic Prelude right now. You know how cool I would be? Uh, everyone says they want wagons, but no one ever buys them. 100%, that's in the marketing material for every brand. This guy wants a manual diesel wagon. Yep, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm tell a manufacturer that. I would love to see the answer. I'm watching this while on my Savage Geese recommended bidet. Thank you. Thank you for giving Toto money. They need it. Uh, how is it? How bad is it that I've gotten rid of five cars in the past two years? You're, you got a problem, pal. Real problem. You've been banned from Mitsubishi after this bad review? No, Mitsubishi has been begging me. Yeah, I haven't. I didn't even. Yeah, honestly, when somebody said, "Are you going to do a Mirage?" I I couldn't believe it was still around. But yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, the 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 Camaro thing is happening this summer. Jack's going to make it happen. I just I just promised it for him, so he's got to make it happen. Otherwise, you get you can uh, get rid of him. Should I trade my N for a GLI? No, no, don't. And I'm going to leave it at that, unless you. Unless you can get all touch control everything, including a steering wheel. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much, and, and everybody. If you have your cat watching this, I really appreciate your cat. Thanks again, and good evening. Thanks, Gene, if you're still out there somewhere.